Well, I bet you probably thought you wouldn't see me again, at least not talking about WWE, but I'm here, and I gotta tell you, I'm not alone. Well, technically I am, because there's like nobody behind me and no one in the place at all, but there's a voice that is going to join me. Mystery voice, speak your name. Well, my name is Cletus Sanford. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. I just, I, it's going to be one point when I actually bother to get a passport and then you do that intro and then I actually pop up behind you and then yeah, that's the video over. That'll be the April Fool's 2017, everybody. There we go. That's a, that's a <laughs> pop anniversary thing right there. It really is. <laughs> So yes, I am joined by Ashley today, and get used to this setup, because it's only going to be here for one time. Because we found Hopefully. another... Go ahead. Hopefully. Well, we found another... Technical difficulties may happen. Yes, we found another way that may make this a, uh, a way to see both of us at the same time. But if not, we're going to continue on this path, and you're just going to see me sit here, and Ashley's going to talk. So it's going to be like a reverse ventriloquist act. It's entertaining, isn't it? <laughs> so for those of you wrestling fans that weren't watching any of the awards coverage, this is going to be completely foreign, you guys. <laughs> so I think it's a good idea to let you guys know probably what you already know already. I have been on a WWE sabbatical since December. I pretty much tuned out. Why? Because the product became just unbearable to watch. I was just tired of seeing it. And I'll still state to this day, as I'm sure Ashley will probably agree with me, and most fans out there will agree with me as well, three hours is way too much wrestling for Monday night. Especially when most of it's not wrestling. Agreed? <laughs> well, when Wiz Khalifa makes a boast about being high on drugs. <laughs> oh, I hate Wiz Khalifa. <laughs> That was the best bit. It was like, oh, this is a family product. And Wiz on Twitter, <laughs> you know, I was high on drugs when I did my music performance. WWE's going, no, we're not booking him again. Yeah. I believe uh, it's like the Jimmy uh, Kimmel uh, mean tweet. Something like, uh, Wiz Khalifa, you look like uh, a cleaning lady. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, but that's true. That's the problem. <laughs> I know. That's, that is the problem. <laughs> so, uh, I actually watched WrestleMania last night, and yeah, I completely tuned out for the product until WrestleMania. I didn't watch the build-up. I didn't watch anything else. If you're a regular viewer here on Pop, you'll know that the only thing I've been watching wrestling-wise is NXT and Impact. Which, by the way, you're going to get that video today as well. But, it'll just be me. So, here's the rules from now on. I will be doing NXT and Impact by myself every single week. That collaboration will not go away. SmackDown, eh, we'll see what happens with that. That's that's always questionable. SmackDown is kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of going to put that in the back a little bit. But I can say right now, without any question, that from now on, at least for pay-per-views, NXT live events, and for Raw, Ashley and myself are going to be the new recappers here on Pop. So welcome, Ashley, to Wrestling Talk on Paw. Yep, it's uh, just especially I'm hyped for the NXT even more now. Oh, but God, yes. I'm a little bit worried that it's going from quarterly to monthly. Oversaturation but, of the product. Yeah, but considering how well Ohio went down and... Uh, Should have been there. Um, was it San Jose this weekend? Yeah, correct. That basically... <laughs> 4,000 people nearly exploded a building. Um, yeah. It was. It shows that it, it's the hot product out there, which makes me feel sorry for other shows out there. Although PWG will probably explode the 400-seat venue that they've got this coming weekend. There's a hmm. lot of people thinking that NXT is going to kill the independents. I think it's going to wound the independents. I don't think it's going to kill them. I, yeah, I don't think it's... It's not going to kill them. It's going to force them to adapt. Because yeah. I clearly think that they're trying to scout the talent from them. Of course. And also possibly try and do shows at those places, possibly at the most inopportune times. Then again, because they might realize that's biting the hand that feeds, they might try and work around. Because 
when they did the Ohio shows, that was the week after um, AIW. Yeah. Which is arguably the biggest one in Ohio. And had their stuff. And obviously, because they knew WrestleMania was happening, PWG had to do their stuff the week before. I, I believe Ring of Honor and the WWN live shows that happened this past weekend did take somewhat of a hit. Oh, yeah. Even they though the WWE thing was in San Jose and actually wasn't in the, the more local, like Santa Clara yeah. area. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens when the uh, NXT goes on tour. You know, honestly, I think it's going to be a really great thing because you have an audience in full sail that know the crowd. It's kind of like how a lot of people would equate TNA in the Impact Zone. Those people actually know, and literally in some ways, know the talent and they're going to cheer for their friends and who they like. And sometimes that's a problem. It just kind of depends on how it comes off on television. I don't know how it comes off on television for you guys, but when it comes down to it, being actually in attendance for TakeOver, I've never heard a louder crowd reaction than when Sami Zayn finally won the NXT Championship. Yeah, that's certainly... I, I could even tell it over the feed. The bleachers sort of were like literally Some of the rocking. moments last night, you could tell oh, yeah. the crowd were, make, make, were marking out all 76 minus 24,000, because <laughs> I don't think that was 76. Uh, just like a good wrestling promoter, you always work the actual attendance of your event. We used to do it all the time in the promotions I worked for. Every single promotion does it. I really hope that because Dave Meltzer said on his thing that it was uh, a fake audience figure, mm -hmm. that because of that they think it's a fake, because it's a fake attendance, that's why the, the WWE uh, stockholders have went, no, <laughs> despite the fact they're announcing record numbers. Did you see the crowd? WWE, it, it's weird. It's WWE logic in the real financial world. What? It's bizarre. This isn't supposed to happen. Well, when you had the live crowd shots last night before we even get into the event, even in the kickoff show, right before the bell time of the first match on the actual pay-per-view, there was a lot of empty seats in that upper deck. I think there were a lot of people not bothered about the undercut. And again, from the build that they did, which obviously you didn't see, yeah, it was one of the worst built WrestleManias in years and turned out to be one of the best ever. <laughs> see, that that's another th reason why I think I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would because I was here, I was by myself, I was able to just focus on everything, do my little notes and everything, and I was able to actually enjoy the show for what it was. I didn't really think about the fact that the build-up hasn't been the greatest and I didn't think about the fact that, oh, I don't necessarily want to see this match because of this reason or that reason. It was one of those things that it was kind of like, you know, I'm looking at it with fresh eyes, even though they're pretty much still doing the same thing they've been doing for two years. That's beside the point. I'm looking at this entire show through fresh eyes, and that makes me think that I was a lot happier with the result than I would have been if I would have been watching the program going into it. I probably would have been just as burnt out as I am currently. Well, after doing Raw recaps, I have had no choice but to watch the, well, at least the Raw product. And uh, I must say, I felt burnout, but when it came to the actual event, mm -hmm. I, d I don't know what they did. I don't know who the scriptwriter was. Yeah. With the amount of shocks that happened, I think it must have been a John Carpenter thing, because there was about uh, that many moments for people getting sh getting scared. Yeah. Well, not really scared, but more like, what? What's going on? So, yeah, um, first off, real quick, uh, Ashley, did you attend, like, a WrestleMania party last night, or did you just hang out with, uh, friends, or just by yourself, or what was your... I was setup? hanging out with friends on Skype, um... Cool. Getting crazy excited, and of course, because of the whole network stuff, my feed was, like, so many seconds behind everyone else's, because of, I guess, the signal delay, or whatever, so... It was always a case of, don't ruin it, I'm behind. Yeah, I consider myself lucky. I had no issues with the network last night at all. It was like crystal clear the whole time. I had no glitches or anything. Wait, it was great. That wasn't the issue. What was the My problem? friends are in America. That's true. So my feed is on a sort of slight delay, because obviously, even though it's sort of coming from European servers, you're not going to get it as direct as uh, US viewers will be getting it on the network. 
Well, it's kind of like when I used to watch the illegal streams back in the day, and they were always a little bit behind. Illegal ones are always delayed. Well, no. Not always. That's sometimes ironic, and sometimes you get the illegal streams, and they're actually ahead of people watching it on their television. That's the that's one of the best bits. Thank you, Sky Sports. <laughs> Seriously, thank you, Sky Sports, for letting me watch so many pay-per-views back before the network. I wouldn't say that, because then they'll go after us. I said before, I have the network now. I, I'm actually grandfathered into the network. I was a first-day subscriber. True, but uh, yeah, even for like European viewers, mm -hmm. I think uh, listening to something... They, somebody only paid 25 euros, I think, in Ireland to watch it. If you take into account that the network is nine ninety nine, mm -hmm. it, it's 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 a difference between ten and twenty five. Yeah, for like a UK or a European viewer, compared to the ten or sixty five it is in America. Gee, that's crazy. Man, them cable companies have got a lot of power. Yeah, but most people aren't going to uh, buy it from the cable company, even so that they don't have to worry about glitches or anything like that. I'll even admit to you that I actually have personal knowledge that Will is now officially a network subscriber because of last night. Oh, my word. And he said he would never do it. Did he sign up just for the Johnny Knoxville thing? He's, he, he loves The Undertaker, so I'm positive that's the reason why. Right. We'll, we'll talk about that match in a little bit. Um, myself, on the other hand, um, I just sat here, I had Buffalo Wild Wings, and I watched the pay-per-view, and I made these really wonderful notes. So, yeah, that's what we've had for this. Um, so, did you watch the pre-show at all? Yeah. I mean, obviously... Well, I, I watched the first hour and saw the clear sort of jibe, at least according to Botchamania, mm. of, uh... Cesaro doing the uh, Scott Steiner Guide to Math. Yes. Always fun. <laughs> um, uh, did you start at the... Uh, well, obviously for us, it started somewhere. It was like 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and then at 5 o'clock is when the actual pre-show started. 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, the actual pay-per-view started. And it ran until pretty much 11 o'clock. Yeah, they took it to the hour. They took it to the bridge. <laughs> so, I'm obviously not a sports fan, as anyone out there knows, but it really ran kind of like how NFL ran, runs the Super Bowl this year. It runs like a lot of sports. You Like, even the World Cup final from mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. Have, like, an hour or so of build-up. But you I know, don't... Do as much build-up as you can just to hype it up, even yeah. though it could be absolutely boring. <laughs> I don't want to see the build-up because I'm going into... It's like AJ not watching movie trailers. I don't want to know the build-up because I just want to go into it fresh and be like, you know, I have no reason to criticize this more than just the match itself, and that's it. True. That, that's why I thought the having the first hour on YouTube and mm -hmm. other platforms other yeah. than the network as well was clearly that enticing thing because it was like, oh, all the matches are only on the network. It was like... Well, that's just by hyping it up. The fact that it's not a very good hype yeah. isn't arguably the best way. You could have at least put one of the matches on to make people go, wow, that was pretty impressive. If you want more, nine ninety nine. <laughs> Why don't you? I would have done like a three way NXT showcase matchup just for exclusively for YouTube. Yeah, but you can't make Triple H look good when Vince is running the show. <laughs> uh, you can't make Triple H look good when he's ripping off Universal Orlando either. But we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> um, the first, it's interesting because with an outdoor venue, especially one that doesn't have like a, that it's completely open air, you have a completely different demographic when it comes to the way the sound works. Sometimes it was very clear who people were reacting to, and sometimes it really wasn't. Which is good. Yeah, definitely. I, I always like that, things. because then when you hear it, mm -hmm. you know it's that loud that they yeah. can, the mics can pick it up. So when John Cena got his imitable, imitable um, John Cena sucks sing-along, yeah. you heard it probably louder than you've heard it ever. Oh, yeah. 
But but just just on that same coin, you also have the yes chant, which was totally not as loud as it definitely was at thirty. Yeah, because they've cooled off on Brian a again, lot. We're obviously dealing with a roof, but yeah, I think some people were still getting in because mm. from what I've heard, the venue, yeah. Levi Stadium, transport wise, bit of a bitch. Yeah, I was reading the re- I was reading like the WrestleCon website on how to get to the uh, the venue, and they were mentioning like the transport you had to take, and I was like, wow, this is really complicated. Well, they had, I think, a basketball game mm-hmm. actually at Levi Stadium. Ooh. Or no, it might have been ice hockey. Some sort of which sport. is weird because it's, it's open air. But yeah, uh, when they had it, they had I think like forty thousand people. So nowhere even near the numbers of seventy if that exists. Yeah, and people were stuck in traffic and trains and buses for mm-hmm. hours. And I heard that was the same thing last night because um, the live audio wrestling show that I listened to from mm-hmm. Canada, they couldn't get Meltzer because he was stuck on a bus. That makes sense. <laughs> um, the only the, the other guys only managed to get back, I guess, to their hotel room two hours after it was finished. And I think they pretty much left pretty much as the pay-per-view ended for you know people watching on network or whatever. Wow. Well, it's probably because you you have quote unquote seventy thousand people trying to get one place at one time. It's pretty much how when uh, the theme parks close, everyone's trying to leave Halloween Horror Nights, and they get in this huge log jam of traffic. And instead of just staying in it, some people just get out of their vehicles, go back to City Walk, and like you know what, I'm gonna get a drink, get some food, and wait till this traffic dies down a little bit. Yeah, there's, there's some cynical people that. I've known, like, in a soccer game mm-hmm. when they've gone 4-0 down at half time, some people have said, I waited till the end of the game because everybody left in the first half, at the end of the first half when we were so far down because oh. the traffic could be easier. <laughs> so they watch the entire game just so they can save on traffic. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, you, you paid so much for the ticket, yeah. you're not going to get a refund. You might as well use it up. And then get out when then there's not many people there. Well, and then boo at the end to show yeah. your frustration at what happened. Well, I was wondering if WWE made any merch money last night using that merchant that sweet merchandise trailer they have because after takeover, considering how many Sami Zayn T-shirts I saw in the crowd that were a new design, yeah. I think they made money. I don't have that yet. Actually, it debuted like the obviously the next takeover event, the January, the the other one. Hmm. The rival one. Yeah. I don't have that one yet. I'm getting it, but I don't have it yet. That's another great thing about the uh, getting first day with the network. They gave you that really awesome discount. I think it's like a $25. That's why you should watch the Raw pre-show. They give out discount codes to plenty every week. I used to when I was recapping Raw on the regular. So now that we're doing this, maybe that'll happen. Who knows? We know what's happening in about 45 minutes then. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no lie. Um, so, Mountain Dew Kickstart is promoting the pre-show, and Mountain Dew by itself is promoting the show. But, obviously, the Mountain Dew bottles remain completely untouched throughout the entire evening. Well, and I think I can make this joke because Lola did it a couple of times during the Hall of Fame. Go ahead. I think if Lola drunk, drunk a little bit of it, he might have another heart attack. Is he? If he drinks the wrong, if he drinks the wrong type of Mountain Dew, because some of them are just sugar central. <laughs> I think he's like a di- he's like Diet Coke drinker, isn't he? Diet Coke, I believe. Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, something like that. Something's got less, yeah, yeah. Diet less, Mountain Dew would less work. Calories and less sugar yeah. or whatever. So unlike the people on the pre-show, I drank my drink. So <laughs> promoting Sprite uh, LeBron James mix, which is really good if you get a chance to get your hands on it. I got a video on this channel about that. So yeah, that's your uh, commercial break. That's all I'm doing. So yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So there. That's what we've got. 
Um, obviously with WrestleMania weekend, there's a lot of awesome, uh, extracurriculars to go on for wrestling fans. If you are a wrestling fan, you are in heaven when it comes to the entire weekend of WrestleMania, the entire week of WrestleMania, because not only are you getting WWE action, but now you're getting NXT action. You have Ring of Honor that's obviously runs every year. You have the big super card show that, um, excuse me, WrestleCon was doing. Shimmer, and there's all sorts of various promotions that were running stuff, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that on the whole indie show the next time uh, you do a podcast, correct? Yeah, there's uh, a lot of stuff that went down, a lot of nonsensical stuff, and uh, I, I think we need to bring up the one thing that happened at Access. Go ahead. Oh, the, oh, uh, the, <laughs> the idiot the trying idiot. to climb the elimination chamber? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's the first time they bring it out to a WrestleMania access. And the last. And probably the last. Because some guy wanted to be a complete prat. Well, it's like when <laughs> some some mark in the front row decided he wanted to uh, make fun of Abyss's mom after she just passed away. And Abyss ripped off his mask and wanted to fight him right then and there. So it took me and about five other guys in the locker room to get him off the guy. Yeah. That happened, and it was not fun. But you see, that, that, that shoot. <laughs> yeah, yes, that it was. Of, it, that sort of in the moment. That isn't guarded off, please do not touch the cage. I'm going to climb it up anyway. <laughs> That's different. That's like you've purposely been told no, but you did it anyway. Hey, Russ. Yeah? I bet you I can climb the elimination chamber. No, you certainly can't. Yeah, watch me. And the next 15 minutes later, he's getting hauled off to jail. How's the prison the food, pal? The guy was German. He climbed up something that doesn't exist to him. Oh, oh God. Hey, just because they call that <laughs> podcast No Way Out because they can't call it Chamber due to historical reasons. Oh, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> My drink is gone. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'll be making some out-of-taste jokes like that throughout the night. No worries, I, I got Especially no problem with that. when we get to the Scarecrows and Kevin Nash. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about The Walking Dead in a little bit. So, <laughs> and the Scarecrows. Here's the thing. <laughs> I like Kevin Nash, thank you very much. Watch him in Magic Mike XXL coming out in theaters this summer. So, <laughs> let's talk about the pre-show match. Obviously, there were two of them on the show. They had the announcement that they were going to bump these matches to the pre-show. And the Battle Royal, given what actually happened, yeah, I get that. The tag team title match, uh, seriously, can they not defend the tag titles on the main show? Like, it happens, but not very often. It was just nice, though, to actually have it on the pre-show, mm -hmm. just as a incentive to say, look, it isn't as bad as we're making it out to be. Yeah, our tag team division is completely screwed up right now, so we need to do something about it. But no, here, here's a four-way dance right now. Enjoy yourself. Well, it isn't helped by one of the Usos injuring his ankle like the week before. Well, it's very smart. They took him out right away in the match so he didn't have to work, so that was a smart move right there. And and then permanently teasing the, is Jimmy going to do it by himself? God, I was hoping not. And then you have the spots with Naomi and yeah. Natalia with the weirdest wonder bra that I've seen her wear in months. <laughs> Rocking the and, leather and uh, spandex combo. <laughs> apparently, uh, WWE got a call from Peter saying, why are you giving a bull a sharpshooter? No kitty kick pads for Tyson Kidd. Has he not been wearing well, them lately? I think, <laughs> I think considering... Rumors that Teddy Hart was in the place. I think that would be gimmick infringement, and he might kill it. <laughs> he would have dove. And also, the top you know, Cesaro, sixty-six and two thirds. <laughs> well, Owen can't do math, and neither can Cesaro. So, here's the thing: this felt very interesting to start off the show because you obviously want to hype the crowd up with a big match to kick off, and the first thing you see when you come through the crowd. The Usos come out first, which is very interesting, as I dropped the bottle. That's the reason we heard that crash in the background. So the Usos come out to a eh, mixed reaction, I guess you could say. Sure. <laughs> from what I've heard from somebody who was actually there in mm -hmm. attendance, yeah. the crowd was actually mega over for all of them, amazingly. The, what I heard personally, Matador's got absolutely nothing. 
Oh, I'm not surprised about that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> new Day, of course, got the new day sucks. New day sucks. And everybody jumped on it, too. Poor Xavier Woods. Of course they sucked. Yeah, yeah. You're in the daylight. Why are you wearing oh fluorescent clothing? Oh my god. We can already see you. Here, here's the thing. Yeah, and, and my friend Scarlett said it the best on Twitter. When it comes down to it, the fact that they were on the West Coast really screwed up a lot of the entrances. But we'll talk about that as we progress in this. Mm -hmm. So, it was a cluster, to say the least. All four tag teams going at it. I love Cesaro and Kid actually got a good reaction. At least that's the one I heard that actually got a good reaction. And the, the Tower of Doom spot, obviously, led to finishers galore. And Jimmy hit the frog splash off the top on Big E. And Cesaro tags him in right on the foot before he's ready to dive. And, of course, he tosses him, steals the pin like a good heel should. And Cesaro and Kid retain. Deservingly so, by the way. That's all that needs to be said. Yeah. Cesaro, former PWG World Champion. Yes. Gets over. Former Ring of Honor Tag Team Champion, too. <laughs> yeah, but considering where you are, PWG is the more well, important. Well, yeah. Sanford's, yes, that, that does make complete sense, to be honest. You're in Cali. Yeah. Cali is PWG country. <laughs> that is very true, 100%. Uh, do you want to talk about the Andre Battle Royal next? Oh, wow. This just seemed like a hodgepodge. Especially because, oh, Axel Mania, Axel Mania, Axel Mania. Four seconds. I guess because of that, he's now eliminated from the Royal Rumble? That has to be it. He's finally been eliminated. Even though, uh, didn't, he Probably. Get, didn't he get eliminated on Raw by Ryback or something like that during the build-up? Yeah, by Dean Ambrose. I, right after. Once again, I did not see this, so I was yeah. guessing. Well, no, he's been thrown over the top rope plenty of times, but he's still going on saying he's... Never been eliminated. I, um, it was a shame how they just seemingly crapped on Itami. Oh my I mean, god, he did get cold. some offense in, but it was just really a case of why are you here? Welcome to the big leagues, pal. <laughs> the only thing that was missing well, was the word pal. His history in Japan? No. Yeah, no <laughs> lie. I do like the giant Tokyo Dome style ramp they had coming to the ring. That was awesome. Yeah, it made sense. It was a relatively subdued graphics board, mainly because the stand that they were doing it from was the smallest one of the four. Hmm. Looking at the panorama shots from outside. The set was So they didn't nice. want to do something too tall, obviously, because hmm. uh, they'd be showing it off from people trying to look in from the outside. Well, it's funny because uh, I love that overhead shot we already had of those guys that are at the very, very top of the building, the one wearing the Roman Reigns shirt, and the camera always went to those guys to show the entire venue. I like the one with the sting head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you... Did you uh, someone... He has two faces. Oh, no. You're a video gamer, obviously, so did you notice that something that I saw on Facebook, like, Ten minutes ago, before we started this conversation, do you know that the uh, WrestleMania 31 logo was like the font of like Perfect Dark? It's it's a font that's from quite a few. Certainly looks Perfect Dark esque. Possibly mm -hmm. a little Splinter Cell. Okay, it's, it's quite a few old school games that it was reminiscent of, but as long as it wasn't a play button. I'm proud of the WrestleMania 32 logo looking like WrestleMania 7. Yeah, America. Yeah, that's right. Fire trucks, beer, women. American beer. Does that mean they're going to have to move it, the venue due to <laughs> a poor ticket sales or security concerns like WrestleMania 7? Yeah, someone decided they wanted to bomb the venue because they don't like Rusev. <laughs> hey, it worked, well, like, it worked like before. The Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, man. There's only two things in Texas, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, so obviously this is the annual. Let's throw everybody on the card that doesn't already have a spot already. Battle Including the people that were in the tag team match yeah. just before. And battle royals are fun. Um, they're fun to be in, I'll say that right now. Um, but they're not necessarily fun to watch. <laughs> not really. They're very hard to keep track of, 
And if you're trying to watch one person, you're going to lose. You're, you're just going to lose. You just need to pay attention to everybody. Now, Unless you kept track of the guys that they were clearly signposting. Yeah. Which was Miz and Miz now. Oh my god, I've been hearing so much about that. Let's get to this match, shall we? So, uh, elimination order, real quick. Curtis Axel gets public enemy immediately. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the best way to describe it. He gets public enemy right after Fair, he rips, yeah. right after he rips his shirt. So, Adam Rose and Fandango eliminate each other, and Mizdow tosses Alex Riley, which is entertaining because Riley was fighting, and Mizdow were fighting over the affections of the Miz for like 15 seconds, so that was nice. <laughs> Zack Ryder almost threw out the broski boot, but of course he got tossed over by Bo Dallas. Who, nice to see him back. Who then, I think, went over the top rope to celebrate. He eliminated himself, I guess the himself, referees yeah. never noticed yeah, apparently they didn't notice a guy jumping over the top rope and doing a victory celebration around the entire duration of the ring. So they had Hideo Itami toss him instead. <laughs> and then the big show eliminated Hideo, who got a tremendous reaction from the crowd. The Hideo chant was definitely out there. And then that's when Michael Cole had the wonderful line of Welcome to the Welcome to the Big Leagues, and I was like, Really, man? Stop. <laughs> Kane eliminated the Matadors by himself because why? Why not? <laughs> Cesaro tosses Sin Cara. Uh, I'm really surprised Kalista wasn't involved in this, given the fact that they've been actually teaming as the Lucha Dragons on the WWE television lately. Haven't they done, like, Superstars matches and stuff, too? Yeah, but there are rumors that Kalisto could be going solo tonight. Good. Good. Him and, ne him and Neville are being... Word is that two people are going to make their debuts tonight. I don't... Because I guess it worked pretty well with Paige last year, and they're trying to do something similar, but obviously not somebody winning the title immediately. Charlotte's going to show up tonight and take the Women's Championship. Yeah. Apparently Will heard me talking about him and sent The Undertaker to turn my power off. In the midst of a sentence. Bomb. Uh, oh my god. Now we're still talking about the Battle Royal, by the way. Um, do I think Charlotte's going to win uh, the Divas Championship tonight? Nah, probably not. But that's what I'm, we're trying to say. Like, it's not, like you said, Ashley, there's probably not going to be a title change tonight with somebody new joining the company. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether, whether it will happen or... We'll certainly see debuts, I think, but... I don't think we're going to see title changes because I don't think Cesaro is deserving of dropping the tag belts because that's realistically the only one. Yeah, Cesaro and uh, Kid could lose tonight to Kalisto and Neville. That that's that's a legitimate possibility if that happened. I guess. By the time this or, video, um, Kalisto and Sin Cara. Uh, no, Sin Cara does not need <laughs> to be his tag team partner. We need to do something else with him. Send him to. Um, yeah, he can work for um, another company. We don't need him in the company anymore. <laughs> I don't like the character of Sin Cara. I never have. <laughs> Unico is fine. I just... I, the guy's... He's, he's, I'm sure he's swell, but it just... I don't like the character. I never have. Just no. Just no. Exactly. Quite simply, just, just no. Just no. Well, let's continue the battle royal, shall we? Uh, Mark Henry tosses Tyson Kidd. How appropriate. We are just talking about that. And the Ascension getting a quick elimination on Mark Henry. Uh, how much NXT talent in this Battle Royal is, is staggering? <laughs> Technically only one, but... <laughs> no, no, no. NXT and former NXT talent. Oh, true. With former NXT... Even, not a huge amount. Even if just for one match, a lot of these competitors have been at least involved in one match on NXT, whether it was as an NXT talent, or whether if I was a, it was a special attraction. Or a dark match. Yes. So the, Ascen oh, yeah. so the Ascension get the quick elimination. Um, I guess you could say they got total elimination. Um, by Ryback. Okay, sure. <laughs> and then Ryback decides he wants to go toss happy, and he tosses Darren Young, and then he tosses Heath Slater... And then Titus O'Neil, because why not toss everybody connected to the same person? Sure. 
The Big Show eliminates Jack Swagger to a mild reaction. I mean, it is Back to the Future year after all. You'd think Swagger would be getting pushed by now. He did write the almanac. Sure. So it does make sense. So the Big Show eliminates the New Day. One after another. Kofi doesn't get his save spot. He just gets thrown. So, okay, sure. And then Eric Rowan gets eliminated because there's nothing for him to do right now. Ryback tosses gold dust, and Cesaro eliminates uh, Kane, who still looks like a backyarder. What is, your, what is your opinion on Kane? I mean, the deadbeat dad look is not in in 2015. He's just doing it in respect to kindergarten cop Schwarzenegger. He's just plain old Glenn, and he wants to be your congressman. <laughs> so Jimmy Uso's in this thing for because why not? And the Big Show tosses him, and then Big Show tosses Cesaro to a uh, not a great reaction. Well, that's playing off those NXT live events. Oh, oh yeah, when they told him they wanted him, to, they got the uh, "Please Retire" chant. I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> God, I'm sure a lot of the same crowd went to. A, I mean, even though they had to travel cross country, I'm sure a lot of the same crowd probably were at both events. I know a lot of people that made the trek to Ohio for that weekend. Yeah. So Big Show eliminates Ryback, and it's down to the final three of The Miz, Damian Sandow, and The Big Show. So Miz, of course, decides he wants to play the chicken like he always does, and he basically says, you, get him, get him now. And Sandow's like, no. And everybody gets a bigger reaction for it. And finally, he snaps. He tosses the Miz over the top rope, which should have been the final elimination of the match. But no. The Big Show is left standing. And in a perfect world, the Big Show just would have stepped over the top rope and eliminated himself. <laughs> but that was never going to happen. Especially not with heel Big Show. But I don't know what day it is, and neither does Big Show, so he could have been face, he could have been heel, he never knows at the time. When he gets to the building, he's like, uh, who am I choke slamming tonight? So, <laughs> that's pretty much how it works. So the Big Show gets the elimination, but kudos to uh, Sandow for getting the, uh, I, I hate to bring this up, but it's true, the guillotine choke that Chris Benoit used to eliminate the Big Show at the Royal Rumble. Yeah. Yeah. Don't mention it. <laughs> yeah, I can mention it here, but I don't think we can mention it anywhere else. Um, Redacted. So, yeah, so the big show wins because we have to play on the fact that obviously back in WCW when he first made his debut, he was the son of Andre the Giant, even though he wasn't. <laughs> and he stands there in a really epic moment with his arms crossed, just like the Andre trophy. So I thought that was a cool moment, but I mean, thoughts on the Battle Royal? Well, as good as it was, the finish basically meant, other than putting Mizdo over further, mm. it had no purpose. Big Show finally won a battle royal after all these years. Well, and... no, I, 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 I'd put it more to the fact that I'd see the Andre the Giant battle royal, like how Cesaro won it last year, That's as like it. a stepping up point to say, <laughs> right, you know, you're going to use this as momentum to possibly get a title shot somewhere down the line. He could challenge Brian or Somebody Cena. with the career of Big Show doesn't need any more title shots. Well, didn't Big Show already have a U.S. title feud with John Cena back in the day? They could just repeat it. Yeah, but we don't want to see that angle again. I never said we wanted to. I'm going with what <laughs> they could probably do. You don't know what's going to happen with Sheamus. Yeah, it's he's a mystery, and by the time that you're getting come this, back heel, yeah, easily he's he kind of teasing it a bit over the weekend, from what I've been hearing. Who knows what's going to happen with Sheamus? He probably is going to be feuding with Brian over the Intercontinental Title, but I'm getting ahead of myself because Brian's not even the champion right now. Because <laughs> that match hasn't oh, happened yet. Is he? That match hasn't Spoilers. happened yet. Yeah, exactly. So, wow, I totally just ruined that. Yay, that's why AJ gets mad at me for spoiling things. Well, <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. If it didn't happen, you would have had booing and people not caring about WrestleMania for the last three and a half hours of the pay-per-view. Except for that guy that really was saying boo earns. <laughs> yes. I was saying boo earns. Sure you were, um, Hines. 
Hans Moment. <laughs> no, no, he's Heinz because if he's Hans, then I'm gonna get a copyright infringement from Matt Groening. <laughs> Okay. I doubt it. Yeah, I doubt it too, but still. Because then if you say Heinz, then 57 varieties will be coming after you. <laughs> I don't like ketchup like barbecue sauce. JR's barbecue sauce, buy it now. Anyway, <laughs> there's your there's your next commercial break. My God. <laughs> hey, have you have you honestly had JR's barbecue sauce and Chipotle ketchup before? No, because they don't sell it over here. Find a way to get some. The Chipotle ketchup is pretty sweet. And you can buy that at jrsbarbecue.com. Now, <laughs> hey, I've got to throw in commercials here every once in a while, so there you go. Let's... It's like WrestleMania. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, product placement mania, of course. So, uh, we get our opening. LL Cool Jade is a really nice opening. I enjoyed that. And uh, Aloe Black, I believe is his name, did the uh, Star Spangled Banner. Mm-hmm. I don't, well, no, uh, America the Beautiful. I, yeah, I'm, obviously I'm not Because you can't promote war. I'm not patriotic, obviously, so I wouldn't know. But he does that thing at the beginning of the show that's getting everybody all patriotized. <laughs> at least it wasn't like that stadium in Maryland in the soccer this week. What happened? That uh, decided to, rather than play the El Salvador national anthem, play the national anthem of the Isle of Man. Because they're next to each other in the anthem library. Oh, wow. Yeah, just a tad. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the seven-way ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship. Um, I really wanted uh, Wade Barrett to retain here because he's been booked like a punk lately, <laughs> from what I've heard. To some extent, although he did get the title back for the last week or so. When did last the, couple of weeks. So, while I was gone, apparently the Intercontinental title became a giant game called Keep Away. Yeah, Renee nearly had it. It's not the hardcore uh, title, so I mean, there's no reason to like, hey, it's mine, give me and it's mine, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Oh, Barrett's still the champion, sorry. The key thing is, everybody had it for the duration of between one show and another. Mm -hmm. Apart from a certain DB. That's probably she done. Made it a bit of a signal. Yeah. Warning. Yeah. Spoiler alert. So, just like Michael Cole very eloquently put it, he basically ended WrestleMania 30 and he opened WrestleMania 31. That's not really a stat you really want to put over. Yeah, but think about it. He was the dark match on 28. Correct. He opened 29. Yeah. He opened 30. Yep. As well as close 30. Mm -hmm. And he opened 31. Yeah. The guy that is the most over personality with the crowds, you're putting on first? Everybody else is going to have to live up to that. That's a problem. And that is why they booked it, though. Because yeah. you would have had that crowd not giving a damn about the rest of the card mm -hmm. because their man was an IC champion. Yeah, but if you put it... Well, that's a way to look at it. I mean, the crowd did want to cheer for Cesaro. If they did it at the Royal Rumble, yeah. they'll do it anywhere. Especially with the amount of international fans you've got that will just do it for doing its sake. Yeah, Raw tonight should be really entertaining given the fact that uh, they still have most of that crowd. So it should be fun. Yeah, I, yeah, I think... Fun in inverted commas, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this uh, this match. Obviously, um, I believe um, when Cody Rhodes comes out as Stardust, he is channeling his his inner geekdom about Marvel comics. Yeah, I he's clearly trying to take the Rey Mysterio mantle. Yeah, but with and villains take instead, the comic, and take the comic book uh, outing. Yeah. I like that, actually. I thought that worked pretty well. Um, I I'm, would say Finn Balor, but he don't want to do that, apparently, in WWE. Um, uh, well... Well, he's still going to do the face paint for the special events, but, I mean, that's... Yeah, but he ain't going to be... He's not gonna he be, ain't going to be painting up like Carnage, because that's copyright. The closest you're going to get to that is what he did at TakeOver. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be the closest. That's the WWE way of doing Carnage. <laughs> 
Speaking of the it's WWE... Called, it's called The Predator. <laughs> yeah, no lie. Uh, Luke Harper got new tights, apparently, while I was gone. He's not wearing the jeans anymore. I... Uh, Again, you, all these attires that they used last night, you will never see again. Dolph Ziggler, apart rocking... from apart from um, Dean Ambrose's, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were his real sunglasses. I'm pretty sure Ambrose was getting ready to try to sell me something at Best Buy with what he was wearing. <laughs> Ambrose didn't even bother. To, everybody else changed their attire. No, nope. Ambrose, nah, just wear a tracksuit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to hang out and fight someone. Fair enough. I like Ambrose a lot, but I mean, and I've been putting him over for a long time, but I mean, yeah. I really wish they had like a direction to go with his gear because he really doesn't have any. <laughs> um, Dolph Ziggler wearing the, uh, the vest, the very Brian Pillman, California Brian-esque vest. <laughs> I like that, Despite actually. Despite being from Hollywood, Florida. I know. <laughs> Like the like the feud with the Miz was literally the battle over Hollywood, Hollywood, California versus Hollywood, Florida. But it really was the battle of Cleveland. True. Um. So what do we got here on this? I'm trying to see what else. Uh, Wade Barrett comes out, doesn't deliver any bad news. Apparently, he hasn't been doing that lately. No, because he's been more worried about getting his belt back. Smart move. Maybe now he can start delivering bad news again. Um, so, R-Truth is in this, because apparently while I was gone, R-Truth became a contender? How'd that happen? R-Truth is, they're just playing on the fact that R-Truth screwed up naming a place two years ago, and that's how his gimmick. Oh, boy. And also, clearly, as JBL says, and this is the one point when I only agree on him, mm. He seems to be a kleptomaniac. Yeah. He's like, I'll steal the belt. It, it's like... You're... And then because he did it, it was like rubbing off and everybody went, well, everyone will steal the belt. I'm Spartacus. Yeah. This is a good time that uh, JTG and Shad Gaspard would have gotten over. Because that would have fit. Truth grabs the title, brings it to them to try to pawn it on their infomercial show because they really would rip off Mo Money that way. <laughs> because apparently, who made the reference last night that Jamie Fo that basically our truth is turning into Jamie Foxx from Booty Call because he totally is. That must have been a JBL. Um, Lawler wouldn't do something that stupid. He's really uh, he's really ahead of his pop culture references. I really, uh, given the fact that obviously I'm a commentator, I do not like the WWE commentary. I never have. I think it's outright abysmal most of the time. Um, there's some really stupid lines here. I Granted, I know that they're not exactly being on their own when they're coming up with these things. They've got people yelling in their headset. Ask Mick Foley, he'll tell you. But some of these lines are just stupid. They're just totally stupid. Uh, let, let's talk about this match, shall we? A little bit of it. Uh, Ambrose gets powerbombed through a ladder. So, uh, that was awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to shorten his career, but, I mean, I guess it was awesome. <laughs> then you have the stunt. Huh? Oh, this ladder that apparently was made of stardust because it broke, or purposely broke, because Barrett basically broke out one of the foot uh, steps. Yeah, I thought that was funny. I've had issues with ladders before, broken during a match. And during... smacked it over the back of ladder. You have to improvise. If you break the ladder that you're involved with, that you have to use to climb in order to grab the championship, you have to improvise. And that's what Barrett was doing. He was improvising. Be because Cody's wife was comment was announcing for this match, I thought she was going to get involved. It was like, <laughs> Lillian isn't doing it herself. I've, I've done that before, managing guys in tag team matches when they were, the title was on the line. They're like, oh, and get up on the ladder, grab our championships. I was like, uh, but guys, I'm not a wrestler. <laughs> and then I get chair shotted off and Russian legs sweeped off the ladder and everybody goes crazy for it. So I guess I did my job that night. Indeed. Exactly. I really love the spot when Harper was climbing with Dolph on his back, literally locked in the sleeper hold. I thought that was done really well. I know it could have really went badly, but it looked awesome. And then he hits the zigzag off the ladder. And at one point, Stardust hits the... Oh my god, that superplex. 
He gets nailed with that superplex from Barrett. Oh my God, if they would have been a couple more inches, they would have hit the ropes and that would have been catastrophic. It would have been third degree mud. Yeah. So speaking of like murdering everyone, Wade Barrett decides to deal out elbows like they're going out of style. And we finally get it to where Dolph Ziggler, wow, God, what a day. Dolph Ziggler becomes the fastest man alive at climbing a ladder. I'm like, you could time him. I mean, it took him less than 10 seconds to get up that thing. He beat Usain Bolt. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So Brian and Dolph are fighting up top of the ladder. They're trading headbutts. Crowd's going nuts for it. Dolph gets knocked off, and Brian grabs the championship and wins the Intercontinental Championship. Which I believe now means that Brian has held every single championship in WWE. Well, that exists and matters. Correct. Sorry, ECW, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> the current championships in WWE, if you want to call him a Grand Slam champion, you can. Although, I, has Brie Bella won the Divas title? I think so. I don't really... I love, I love the women's matches, but I don't... I th I think Bree's been a women's champion before. Are you work I think Bree had it for a bit, possibly. Hey, since I'm going to go ahead and like break the fourth wall here, guys, we're making this a combined WrestleMania and Raw recap because it's 30 minutes until Raw starts, and we're going to join you right after that. So we're going to combine these videos together. By the time that this video airs, Ashley and I have already seen Raw, so Ashley, find out if uh, Brie Bella was a Divas champion or not. <laughs> I will search it out now. Awesome. So, yeah, the, the match was insane, as it always was when it comes to ladder matches. I mean, I I enjoyed it for what it was. I mean, Ambrose got taken out, and the crowd didn't really like that very much, obviously. And it came down to Dolphin Bryan. I thought that was a great way to end it, because the crowd obviously wanted either one of them to win, so that you're going to win either way if you're a fan and you're watching this match, if either Dolph or Brian win. Yeah. Uh, just looking at <clears throat> Bree has never won the belt. It's such a shame. Nikki's won twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> oh, no, no, no. Hold on. Bree has won. Brie has won once, okay. so why didn't they mention that in the opening paragraph? Thanks, Wikipedia. <laughs> Proving people right and wrong since the year Wikipedia started. <laughs> <laughs> so, Which, of course, according to Wikipedia, was 482 BC. That's right. The year that cockroaches came into existence, and Keith Richards, too. Now... <laughs> Uh, let's talk about our next match on WrestleMania. Um, the next match on the actual pay-per-view was the uh, Seth Rollins and Randy Orton match. Seth Rollins has been wearing this laser tag gear for the longest time. And he kind of decided he wanted to tra change it up a little bit, wearing, like, the yellow pinstripes on to, like, define his body. I thought that, that worked, I guess. I'm always happy to see Jamie Noble and Joey Mercury at ringside. I really wish they would get some sort of a match. Did they wrestle any when the build was on? Um, yeah, they were involved in some matches. Like, t two weeks ago, they were in the main event of Raw. Mm. I was like, yes! This is what I wanted. That's awesome. I, I totally missed that. Obviously, like I, you guys probably know, I have not been watching. Orton's wearing the red gear tonight, so... Got a nice reaction from the crowd. It's... Really awesome to chant for a guy that likes to kick people in the head. That's cool. Sure. <laughs> so... Oh, it's friendly. What'd you say? Oh, it's friendly. Yeah, very. Randy Orton is the most friendly guy you ever meet in your life. So Randy Orton is the snakebite DDT on the J&J &J on the floor, which I like that spot. I thought it worked really well. And Rollins, of course, makes him eat the toe pay to pay for it. So, no one's up eating the RKO. Mercury has the gall to jump off the top rope and eat the RKO, so why not? And while all this is going on, Rollins hits the curb stomp, and it's a near fall off of that. So, he goes up for the Phoenix Splash, and the IWC, you can tell, are about ready to just, like, explode. And, of course, he comes off the top, and like he's been doing lately, not actually hitting the move, he just kind of 
lands on his feet and does like the lucha roll out of it because he's not hitting the move anymore. He lands on his feet, he goes for the RKO to Zorton, he gets tossed off, and he catches the spinning back kick, he goes for the curb stomp, and in one of the finishes that will be now synonymous with WrestleMania 31 forever in a day, he gets the most unique way into the RKO that I've seen in a long time. He propels himself up in the air on the curb stomp, and Orton catches him on the way down with the RKO. It was a thing of beauty, to say the least, and Orton won clean as a sheet right there. What do you think of that 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 spot right there? Just that match. Just that match. Oh, y- you know, I mean, it, it was the only one of the card that I was excited for. Even despite really? the fact they sort of ruined it three weeks ago by Orton basically destroying. I heard about Seth. that. Why would you care about anything that comes after that? Because Orton's already destroyed him. Hey, we don't need to have a match well, now. Because He's already you realize the talents and basically you realize they could put on a good match. Well, yeah, of course. Anybody can see that. And uh, they did just. Mm-hmm. It shows you how confident Seth is. Oh, yeah. To be able to execute these spots and make them look good, especially okay. with the whole super curb stomp to RKO. <laughs> I, that, that was amazing. The funny thing is, I was sitting here watching the show, and I was thinking, are they going to... Okay, obviously we've seen what Matt Seidel did with the shooting star press into the RKO, and everybody else has been trying to do it ever since. And do a version of it, something like to top that. I think what could have topped that is if Rollins went for the Phoenix Splash and got RKO'd out of it. That seems like something that's going to happen down the road. Yeah. Because I think that would be a thing of amazing amazement if I saw it like that. All right, let's talk about some interesting things that happen. Um, obviously, our next match is our WWE versus WCW match. <laughs> uh. Okay, there, there's a lot to be said about this. And hopefully I don't get cut off in this. And if I get cut off in this, you're going to get a really bad cut. And I'm going to say, and we're back. So that's how you'll know that I got cut off in this. There's a lot to be said, Ashley, about what happened between Sting and Triple H. Yeah, let, 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 let's start with the entrances. Yes, we shall. We'll start with Sting. He had a bunch of Japanese drummers that were doing... It was really awesome, like, drumming and everything. They were standing on the stage. By the way... Could you not have imagined this to look a whole lot better if it was in pitch black darkness with a white spotlight on these drummers? Seriously, the the sun kills the entrances and totally did all day. Well, true, but also I'm wondering, what has this Japanese stuff got to do with Sting? Nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> hey, uh, um, I don't really... I, Okay, the idea that was made was a podcast I was listening to last night. The only thing that comes to mind, and this is really reaching to say the least, was they really wanted to say, wow, Sting really is Brandon Lee's crow, so that's the reason why you got those drums like that. And that's really reaching to say the least. But I wouldn't be surprised if a WWE writer was like, hey, that makes sense, let's do that. But Sting comes out of the Tokyo Dome ramp, and <laughs> he got a good reaction, But this and this was the right place to do a Sting match, but once again, I've said this before, I'll say it again, this was not the match the crowd wanted. This was not the match the crowd wanted, at all. If they wanted to do anything with Sting, Triple H was not on that list even close. It's not what they wanted, but what they got, I think they were still satisfied with. Oh, especially if you're a nostalgic wrestling fan. If you're not... Which is, let's be honest, about 80% of that crowd. Especially, well, people that are going to pay thousands upon thousands of dollars to go to WrestleMania and spend on merchandise, on food, on parking, on plane tickets. Yeah, that's the diehard of the diehard. So, yes... I would say that you're right. When it comes down to it, these are the fans that you need to be performing in front of. But because oh. just the the whole spot when DX just show up, it was like what? We're we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> Oh, no, no, yeah, I forgot. Let, We've let, got to bring up that entrance. Yeah, we, okay, so Sting comes out, and I'm playing with a comb here, sorry. Okay, Sting comes out, 
And what happens is he gets a nice reaction. He's not wearing a shirt, so anybody that thought that we were going to see Sting in a t-shirt at WrestleMania, they were wrong. Obviously, he's not as defined as he was back in the day, but you know, he's all right. He's doing okay for himself. So Sting comes out. He gets in the ring. He acknowledges the people. And, oh, by the way, I totally love the fact that the guys that were doing the drumming, number one, the one guy didn't want to do it at all, obviously. And he sticks out like a, <laughs> he sticks out like a sore thumb. And two, I thought it was really great because the people that were painting their faces, they painted the goatee thing, too. So, yeah, they all had that as well. So Sting, doing the right details. so Sting's in the ring. And then we get this clip that kind of reminds me of when The Rock went Hollywood. When they were showing, like, cities and everything. And I was thinking, oh, God, we're, gonna, we're about ready to watch, like, Sharknado 3. <laughs> and then we see Arnold. And, oh, my God. He says, Judgment Day is here. It's time to play the game. Which apparently was filmed the night of the Hall of Fame because that's how long it took them to lock down Arnold to do this, VO. Despite the fact they announced on uh, that Arnold interview, which was done the week... Go ahead. And apparently we're having issues on Skype right now, so that's kind of what happens with live television, folks. And if Ashley disappears, obviously we have to uh, wait until he reconnects, but um, hopefully that'll work. Ah, that's, yeah. that's so loud. Hopefully we'll get the Genesis. Hold on, you to I totally missed everything you just said there because it completely cut out and I had to say that, sorry, there's Skype issues. No problem. No, uh, it's... Yeah, you're talking we about just the, interview. Had the whole video hype. We knew it was going to be a Terminator entrance. Yeah, of course, because why weeks. not? And the fact that they had, you know, you got to plug Terminator Five Mega Drive, or as it's known in America, Terminator Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. No, gaming people will get that joke going. Don't worry. Uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, here's the th <laughs> here's the thing, though. There was the rumor that Hunter was going to come out and do the Arnold-esque Terminator entrance, and he was saying that he was going to be wearing the sunglasses, and he was going to be wearing the black leather jacket. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, that's how Hunter used to look in the 2000s. So, what are they going to do instead? Well, they decided they wanted to rip off the Terminator attraction at Universal Studios. Because you had the Terminators coming out of the, s of the ground... And you had him wearing the, oh my god, Triple H that, trying to look no, like a cyborg. I, I, I like the Terminators because you could see that they were like the real things. They were. Straight up stolen from Universal Studios Hollywood. Now Triple continue. H. <laughs> oh I don't know whether the reason why he wore that costume is because it, it was uh, made by his eight-year-old kids. <laughs> Daddy, wear this on camera, please. Okay, whatever oh, you say. All right. All right, uh. That's the only thing that makes sense, because that get-up was utterly shambolic. He, he looked like he didn't want to be there either. He was like, this is a great idea on paper, but my God, now that I'm sitting here looking at my skeletal arms, it's kind of like, this is stupid. Let's get this off now. Play the music. It doesn't even look like a believable exosuit, if that's what it was trying to be. No, no. I've seen better ones at pictures of looking at Comic-Cons. Oh, breaking news from the Raw pre-show. I think I just saw Paige's mum. <laughs> I'm not exactly surprised. Soraya is in the building. I approve. There is a rumor, not really a rumor, but it's pretty much fact, that most of the families of the uh, cast of Total Divas are in the building tonight because they're shooting footage for the next season. So we may see I don't Sor care, as long as Soraya Knight's there, that's all that matters. We may see Soraya on Total Divas. Oh, that'll be interesting. <laughs> yes, keep your finger on the button. <laughs> so, so Triple H comes out, and he's carrying the heads of the exoskeletons. Literally, the skeletons of the exoskeletons. And I wrote in my notes here, broad daylight equals bad idea. 
because this entrance does not fit the daylight at all. This is another entrance that would have definitely benefited a spotlight. Also, if you're going to have a red light in the center of the logo, yeah. don't make it look like Hal from 2001. <laughs> I'm sorry, Hunter. You're going to lose now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sting. Vince is still an egotistical maniac and wants to promote the fact that he killed WCW. And I'm a w down. And I'm a WCW guy through and through. Apparently, there was some sort of a mention that this was going to be a match with just pinfall or submission. That's it. So, somewhere along the line, this became a no-DQ match. When did that happen? Um, when they said it. <laughs> really? That was the first time they said anything? all the time, it was just one-on-one, one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one, nothing about no holds <laughs> barred or anything. Of course not. Why not? <laughs> They make it up as they go on. So this match was, I mean, it was okay for what it was. Let's let's talk about when it became fun for nostalgic wrestling fans. So Sting goes for the sharpshooter. Degeneration X music hits, and X Pac, the Road Dog, and Billy Gunn come running out, and they were running. I can vouch for I'm this. I'm literally watching this now on the in, on the pre-show. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> They're running out of the back to save Triple H. And Sting ends up diving on them, because why not? Sting gets back in the ring, he eats the pedigree, one, two, and no, Sting kicks out. So Triple H gets the sledgehammer, and the NWO music hits, because literally, why not? This would be awesome for this to happen. Obviously, everybody has wanted to see Degeneration X against the New World Order. If they didn't do it at Raw Reunion and we're all buddy-buddy, this actually would have made a whole lot more sense. Would you agree? Ashley? Ashley? Hold on. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. So what happens to live television sometimes, things just cut out, and it cuts out really randomly, so yeah, sorry about that. That sound is not fun. So, you obviously have the nostalgia kick of the NWO on one side, obviously representing WCW, even though they were trying to kill it for multiple years, versus Degeneration X, which apparently is now... Team WWE, even though they tried to be the authority breakers for the entire duration, they were a stable. So that makes a whole lot of sense, especially if you're a longtime wrestling fan. And I just lost Ashley, so hopefully he'll be returning uh, momentarily. But as I wait for him to call back, it's really weird because you have this fight between the NWO and Degeneration X, and they're fighting, and granted, I know, if this would have happened back in the day, this would have been awesome, and it still was awesome. It was a nostalgic moment. You obviously had Hall, Hogan, Nash standing there fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe against X-Pac, Billy Gunn, and the Road Dog, and it was awesome. It was awesome for what it was. Now, granted, I know that the NWO have slowed a bit, and I know there's a lot of people that have played a lot of jokes about their age and everything like that, but no worries. I'm not going to be that guy. So, yeah, I thought it was good for what it was. Hogan looked in a lot better shape than he's used to looking in. And I think that's the way that I want to say this. Anyway, so it was really weird because I, uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to continue this in just a few minutes because Ashley needs to join me. Actually, I'm going to uh, change my mind here. I'm going to end this now and uh, join us for what you're going to see as a, cl a cut and then to the next video. But what is going to, in all actuality, be part three, talking WrestleMania and Raw. So that's going to continue in just a moment. Now, this is going to appear that this is just a cut but i can assure you like i just told you a minute ago this is basically many hours later raw's already happened and we're going to talk about that we're going to finish wrestlemania first so 
Obviously, Ashley got cut off midway through, and how appropriate we're talking about this match, because you just got Skypie and Death Drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very appropriate. And, obviously, The Undertaker, through Will, wants to take out my video feed and my entire power in my house, so that's taken care of. Now we should be able to roll right through. Sound good? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah, same here. So Don't cross your fingers, because it won't work. <laughs> The NWO music hits, and of course, here comes Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash. Now, I'll give it up, just like I said before when you weren't on the, the call. When it comes down to it, Hogan actually looked in some pretty good shape. He got down the ramp rather quickly. Yeah, and to, all three of them didn't look too bad. No, they really didn't. And then the fact that two of the three have had surgery recently... Yeah. And took all mighty bumps made me go, really? Yeah. It's WrestleMania. You gotta take bumps. <laughs> no, Scott Hall had a hip replacement two weeks ago, well, not two weeks ago, but a few months ago. Yeah, and he took a backdrop on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. No, that, that, that isn't what you do. No, no, it's not. But it's WrestleMania, and if it was going to happen any time, this was going to be the night that it was going to happen. Vince has got a lot of money, clearly. Oh, yeah. If that went wrong, ooh, lawsuits of the guys. Big time. So we finally get our face-to-face -face battle between NWO and Degeneration X, so they start fighting. And this distracts Hunter momentarily, so Sting makes him eat the Scorpion Death Drop. He gets a two and a half off of that. He goes for the Scorpion Death Lock, and... Triple H is grabbing for the sledgehammer. Hogan's like, not tonight, brother. And, of course, playing up more historical information than only true fans know, X-Pac's the one who decks Hogan. How appropriate. Yeah. So Nash nails Pac because Wolfpack on Wolfpack violence apparently sells tickets. And Billy Gunn is the one that takes out Kevin Nash. I'll give it up to Billy Gunn wearing the most fluorescent green shoes I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you could spot him from like a mile away. Meanwhile, Scott, yeah. Hall, Scott Hall goes for the outsider edge on the floor. And of course he gets backdropped by the road dog. This whole thing, Triple H is trying to press up out of it. And he finally gets to the bottom rope. And out of absolutely nowhere... The real true dream match between two of the top baby faces of both companies at the time. Shawn Michaels comes out and sweet chin music to Sting. No one was expecting Shawn Michaels to be in this. It made sense, but no one thought Shawn Michaels would be out there. They probably just thought he'd be there for the Hall of Fame and that'd be the end of it. But no, he helped Triple H. So... A crotch chop and Sean goes to ringside. Because this basically becomes an impromptu lumberjack match. Triple H goes for the cover. Stink still kicks out. Billy Gunn heads Triple H the sledgehammer. Again, that's hilarious if you remember backstory. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that back in the day, Billy Gunn would have probably handed Triple H the sledgehammer right between the eyes. <laughs> But again, money talks, and history is not going to repeat itself, apparently. So he's stalking towards Sting, and Scott Hall hands Sting the bat, because, just like I said, while you were away, it's really awesome that the Generation X is fighting for the WWE when they were trying to fight authority, and the New World Order are fighting for Sting when all they wanted to do is dismantle him. Sure. <laughs> Any thoughts? Yes. Seems, seems legit. Yeah, it's, 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 it's professional wrestling. It makes sense. So, at this point, Triple H eats the bat in the stomach, and he breaks the sledgehammer in half because reasons. Sting hits the stinger splash. He goes for it again, and Triple H ends up decking him with the sledgehammer out of nowhere, makes the cover, and the referee counts three. So Sting loses his first WrestleMania match and his first WWE match to Triple H. Now, I, I don't know if I like this, honestly. If the storyline wasn't about WWE versus WCW and they made it decidingly clear that that's what it was about, Sting probably would have won this. 
But like you said, Vince's wonderful ego wants to bury the last piece of WCW left, and Triple H wins. Because he was the flag bearer of the WWE, now wasn't he? Yeah, he's he uh as as proven by Max Landis's wrestling isn't wrestling, he pretty much killed any interest in wrestling for about eighteen months between two thousand and three and two thousand and five ish. Yeah. Th- that's phenomenal if you haven't checked it out yet. It's I totally recommend it and I know Ashley does too. Oh, oh hell Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, DX celebrates, Hall, Nash, and Hogan check over Sting. Again, once again, if this was going back to the good old days, if you will, this would never have happened. (laughs) Ever. Triple H calls everyone off, extends his hand, Sting thinks about it a second, and they shake hands. That's the end of the segment. Um, okay. (laughs) Thoughts? Pretty much what I've already said. It, you know, it was a good match. No, the match had those mark out moments with mm. NW and DX coming out. It's just a shame it had to finish in the mat. I wouldn't have objected to obviously Triple H hitting with the, the stump of the sledgehammer. Yeah, but I just think Sting should have gone over. Now, it's... Because I don't know whether Sting should be worthy of going yeah. over on Undertaker, if that even happens. I don't know at this point. We'll talk about Sting later, because that's way farther in advance. But still, it's one of those things, there was a lot of rumors saying this was going to be Sting's first and last WWE match. Not just WrestleMania match, but his first and last WWE match. If this mm-hmm. ends up happening, think about it from this perspective. Sting has lost his last three matches inside a ring. He lost to Magnus. He lost to Ethan Carter the third, and now he's lost to Triple H. Great way to end your career. <laughs> but but I will give it to people's credit. When you go out, you always go out on your back. That's pretty much the credo in the business. So if this is the last time we'll ever see Sting in a WWE ring, which I don't think it is, he put on a great performance and probably shut up a lot of naysayers. Yeah. It was... <laughs> it was, I think, better than the people saying, oh, Sting is past it. Oh, yeah. And well, anybody... Were thinking it was going to be. Anybody that followed him in TNA knows that he had some really good matches in TNA. But, I mean, look at the majority of the general public that have no idea who Sting is. They don't know anything about his background. They don't, don't know anything about WCW at all. They're probably... No. It, they didn't build Sting up enough. There's enough people in the know to know who Sting is. At WrestleMania there would be, yes. I agree with that. No, I think there's enough WWE... The, most of the people that have the network would be the fans that want to see the old stuff. That's correct. That is 70 to 80 percent of what's on the network. All I want to watch is WCW on the network. I'm not going to even lie about that. I'm a WCW guy. So that's that's just it. Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> so we Enough get. Said. What'd you say? Enough said. Enough said, exactly. So Daniel Bryan runs into the prerequisite let's get as many legends in one segment as we possibly can segment of the night. Roddy, we're alive. Roddy Piper mean mugged him, and then he like was like ah that's I'm kidding like you did a great job kid. So, Pat Patterson shows up because of course they talk about the fact he was the first ever Intercontinental Champion, the Phantom Tournament, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Everyone knows that story. And to go back to the pre-show, I thought it was a cool moment that Joey Mercury and Jamie Noble were going over to try to uh, get stuff for Seth Rollins. And they show up at catering, and who's there? Also to get coffee for Vince McMahon, but Gerald Briscoe and Pat Patterson. And they even called J&J Stooges. I thought that was funny. It was good to have the reminiscing. Oh, yeah, totally. And WrestleMania, it totally fits, too. So, of course, this is not the end of this segment. Not even by a long shot. 
because Ricky the Dragon Steamboat comes out and says, this match is on par with the match that Steamboat had with the Macho Man Randy Savage, which, that's not true. But, it's a good put over, good put over for Daniel Bryan, given the fact of one dragon to another. Think about that. True. And then Ric Flair, who woos, of course, and then Bret Hart shows up, and then... Everybody starts chanting yes, and it's really funny because Ric Flair actually chops Ricky Steamboat, and Steamboat looks at him like, did you really just do that? What the hell you doing, son? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And of course, you can't end WrestleMania moment without Ron Simmons saying his prerequisite catchphrase. Which I'm sure... Hey, thank you, Ashley. Uh, Maria Menounos was a part of this, too, because obviously, why not? And um, once again, I stay... I can think of why, a reason why not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Once again, I state this every single time. Now, obviously, this is the same thing I can say about our truth When it comes down to it, there is absolutely no mention of the fact, most of the time, that Ron Simmons, the first African-American world heavyweight champion in company history, is relegated to a one-word catchphrase now. Just like our truth is relegated to a comedy, comedy uh, storyline that ends up being a uh, seven-way cluster ladder match. Could be worse. You could be trying to send his Hall of Fame ring on eBay. Isn't that right, Abdullah? Abdullah the Butcher. I'm looking at this rib. That rib business must not be doing very well right now. George Mayfield doesn't have his uh, people to come out and buy your forks anymore, apparently. <laughs> so, yeah. Then we get our musical segment, which there's no need to talk about it. Skylar Gray, Travis Barker, and uh, no one cares about Kid Ink. Because, yeah. <laughs> David Guetta would have been in there, but he was pleasing. 200,000 people on Twitch and about another 50,000 people at the, I think it's called the Ultra Music Festival. That sounds right. I saw the first night. It was mm. supposed to go until midnight, so I don't know if that's Pacific or Eastern. Mm. But either way, the thing was still going on when I was up at uh, like 7 or 8 in the morning. Where was the show taking place? I think it was somewhere in America. Was it Miami? I'm not sure, I'm not sure where. I can't be bothered to look because it's not wrestling related, but right on. he's the guy that also does that song with Skylar Grey. Okay, right on. And he also but has he, a I, You know, at career. the same time, he was doing this gig, which, yeah, it's a music festival. What's it on Twitch for? Yeah, it's <laughs> weird. Pop would be on Twitch, but I don't think they would allow that, so. Uh, if you could, if they can allow the Ultra Music Festival, I think they're, they're slacking. <laughs> we'll get on that immediately plus you know with YouTube trying to go into live streaming Twitch might just go yeah we'll allow it. <laughs> I officially have the capabilities for Pop now to go live anytime I want once I can figure out how to make it work so that's coming in the future so we get our next match it is our women's tag team match you know Ashley I don't know if I'm the only one but I really hate the term diva yeah but you gotta give them a chance I know. I hate the term diva. And WrestleMania the term. You didn't. No, no. Uh, women's wrestling knockouts are fine because it seems like it's synonymous with the brand. Divas just seems like it's a downhill spot. And given the fact that Medusa comes back when she does her Hall of Fame induction and she brings back the WWF Women's Championship out of the trash, where she left it obviously on Nitro. Why don't they just bring back that championship and get rid of the butterfly belt once and for all? Vince? I, we need to get rid of it. We got rid of the spinner belt, finally. I mean, the, the WWE title still has a has bling about it, but I mean, it's not as gaudy as the spinner belt was, so... Uh, I don't have that much of an objection to it, you know. I just, I don't I like... have more of a problem with the, uh, the two penny pieces that are the tag belts. Oh, yeah, the penny tag team titles, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm more of an issue with that than a Divas, because at least a Divas one, although it's pink. It's a butterfly. It looks, like, it looks like a belt, not something that's been made from old bottle tops. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I backyarded in a Fed that actually had, like, Trapper Keepers as their championships, and that was better looking than the WWE Tag Team titles. Even Lucha Underground knows that when you have a crap title, mm. you destroy it and replace it with something. Yeah. Why haven't they done that with the tag belts? I really Which thought because they don't have a tag division. Well, I really thought that they were gonna that when Paige won the championship, 
she was she was the anti diva and she was going to get rid of the butterfly belt once and for all. But they decided to keep her with it, so it's going to stick around. They've got total divas to promote, so obviously it's a double edged sword, really. And I'm not talking about what's on Lesnar's chest either. <laughs> I thought that was something else. <laughs> We'll talk I about. A, I, I thought that was an unauthorized picture of Seth Rollins. We'll talk about the sword and the shield in a little bit. So uh, the tag match is obviously the Bella Twins against AJ Lee and Paige, uh, the frenemies against the, the belt, the Mean Girls, obviously. So the Bellas work Paige over. They keep AJ out of the ring so much that she basically sells for three minutes off a drop kick. Yep. Did you catch that? Did. I can't talk about Raw, but it went very similar on Raw. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk With about that. Talent not getting involved. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about Raw as we do, we'll dive into that in a minute. Yeah. So Paige hits the cannonball off the apron on the Bellas, and Paige just picks up Brie and just launches her into the ring steps because it makes sense to me. AJ gets the Black Widow on Nikki, and Nikki has to tap out. So. I mean, the match was okay. I've seen better women's matches, but it was all right for what it was. It wasn't like a three-minute match that meant nothing, and it wasn't a 45-woman match that basically ended in two seconds with the roll-up. So, it's baby steps. It really is. Yeah, it's it's just a shame that they... It's not the time that they were given, but just the execution of mm -hmm. what they had to do. It just didn't really fit. And no, it didn't flow very well, unfortunately. So, of course, we get into the Hall of Fame segment. Did you watch the Hall of Fame? Absolutely. <laughs> I was working all night. I literally worked till 3 o'clock in the morning. I had no time to watch the Hall of Fame yet. Well, I think it's being replayed at some point in the network on the network this week. I mean, Wednesday or Thursday, possibly. Oh, good! I got some time to watch it while I'm at work. That'll work. Sometime in the afternoon, it's on the live stream, and I'm guessing it's probably going to be archived as well mm -hmm. for you to catch on demand. Oh, that's fine because I—that's what I basically watch the network on when I'm not here watching it on the desktop. I watch it on my tablet at work. I mean, I do my job. Very, very well. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> no, there there was a time we were watching Survivor Series and I uh, forgot to lock the door, so... <laughs> it just happens. Yeah. So, the Hall of Fame class is announced, and um, whoever was doing the Chiron for the Hall of Fame needs to be fired immediately. They got Lanny Poffo's name wrong. No two Fs, just P-O-F-O. -O, Pofo. Perhaps it was some sort of tribute to uh, Michael Jackson, and they thought it was faux show. <laughs> nice. Let's talk about a match that I really had a lot of hope for, not knowing anything about the backstory, and that's Rusev and John Cena. You know the Rocky match? <laughs> that entrance. That entrance! Oh my god. So, Rusev comes out. You don't see him first. We see Lana being led out by a group of Russian soldiers, and they're carrying a Russian flag. Lana looks to be smiling from ear to ear. Obviously, she hasn't started her press run Anti -tank for Anti-tank guns galore. Yes. And here comes a freaking tank. Rusev riding in a Russian tank. I thought that was awesome. Rusev borrowed DX's tank. Yeah, pretty much. That was pretty awesome. I'm not gonna lie. Cena didn't really have a very uh, over-the-top entrance like he usually does at Mania, though. He had Ronald Reagan to thank. Yeah. I would have thought they would have done something different, but, I mean, I know I was expecting him to come out wearing the Apollo Creed top hat, but no, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I mean, Xavier he Woods has it somewhere. Xavier That's Woods has it somewhere. Huh? He came out to nothing. I know. If, if it was any, if it was any time for like the U.S. soldiers to come out and do like a guard of honor for him, yes, it was here. But they've done it before for less. Yeah, we had the Cena loves the little children. You know, this is the before. most important match in John Cena's career. Yeah, because he has to beat the evil Rushki. <laughs> um, Baron Von. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 
So, um, this match was okay for what it was. Um, Cena hits a really awesome spot. He hits, like, a springboard into an ace crusher, which kind of, like, made everybody, even the people that hate Cena, like, wow, that was really good. I'll clap for that. <laughs> so, we go to, obviously, we're going into the finish here. Uh, Muay Thai Kick connects. Will Barrow Face Buster and the Accolade, which, of course, Cena breaks. Drop to hold STF, and Rusev ends up inadvertently knocking Lana off the ring apron. Which, of course, is going to write her off television for a bit while she makes her WWE film. Well, I guess. Well, obviously she's going to come back and she's going to have words for Rusev, but I mean, who no, knows? she's going to come back and wrestle. Cool. From what I've heard, she's been practicing in national. I wouldn't have a problem with Eating the that. shit out of Dixie Carter for being an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. And she's also got to promote Pitch Perfect 2, too, so, I mean. Yeah, but I don't think she's in it as a major character this time. She's not a major character, but she's, like, I guess she's one of, like, the the older generation Bellas. So, which is weird, because she wasn't that in the last one, so. At least she isn't having sex on the plane like in Banjo. Yeah. Find it, Jordan. Yes. The pictures, just like X Files, David Duchovny knows they're out there. <laughs> John Cena wins the U.S. Championship again. Rusev yells at Lana while Lana's basically just standing there holding her ankle, and Rusev bombs out to the back. Um, Cena wins, and already tonight on Raw, what happens? He's wearing his uh, "The Champ Is Here" America version. I think that is the stupidest thing you could give a T-shirt to. Here, point down. The championship is around my waist. I just couldn't think it was it could have said these nuts. Yeah, uh, John Cena would say something like that on the mic, though. <laughs> since it was, since apparently tonight's edition of the show was Raw is bitch. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, where are we now? We are going to go into the fact... <laughs> Here's an interesting segment. So Triple H and Stephanie come out to announce the very inflated attendance record that is now set at Levi oh, Stadium. 14. <laughs> yeah. 14 people were there. 14 people. Everybody else were just robots that were hired by WWE. <laughs> that were more realistic than the Terminator the costume for Triple H. Exactly. Triple H and Stephanie take credit for everything, of course. And who interrupts? The Rock. Spitting Dwayne. Yes. Just coming off of a uh, not-so-successful uh, showing at SNL, which apparently got really low ratings from what I heard. Well, because people were watching the Hall of Fame instead. Exactly. Uh, so after I, seeing it, the sketches were pretty good. The, the Coco sketch is priceless. Um, I think Bambi was the better one. Actually, I I like them both. Honestly, I mean SNL can go like either way with me, but Dwayne is going to be part of the Five Timers Club soon, and that's a very prestigious award to have. Yeah, it's, it's but it makes crazy. sense. It's crazy that he's that he of all people's on that list, but eh. so he comes out to interrupt. Triple H says, "You know what? I beat you before. I've got nothing else to prove to you." And The Rock, of course, has to drop the line that you must have left your balls in Stanford, Connecticut. <laughs> Stephanie says the truth. If there weren't no McMahons, there'd be no Rock. He'd still be working indies if it wasn't for the McMahons. <laughs> yeah, but... He probably... Yeah, he would have made it. Wasn't. He would probably would have got to WCW and then probably ended up working and ended up in TNA at some point and... That would have been the end of that. <laughs> and then WWE would have to have him down the line. Or they just don't want to use him, depending on how uh, history would have ran. We'll never know now, will we? <laughs> Probably. So, uh, Stephanie slaps The Rock and says, get out of my ring. Because Stephanie really, right now, wants to be her dad. Big time. It works, but she really wants to be her dad. She says, catch you later, Dwayne. Hasta la vista. Bye bye. You know the the Mad TV line, the bye bye, the Lancome lady. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. So the Rock stands very 
smartly by the four horsewomen who are at ringside. Well, mainly, well, basically, he's about to walk and leave, and she says, you know, oh, you wouldn't dare hit a woman. Yeah. Then starts walking over round ringside. And some of the crowd, I guess, were already starting to guess what was happening. I guess some of them knew. Oh, they picked up on it quickly. Ronda was there, because they did show it earlier on the night, but... Mm. It's just the way it was unveiled. Rock looks, and the camera just pans over. And there she is. And Rhonda's standing there, and it's like, wait, what? Yeah. She's, at, she's actually going to be jumping the barrier and doing something? And yep. Yep. <laughs> and she got a Rhonda's going to kill you chant started by the crowd. <laughs> Considering how our last two matches have gone under 30 seconds and combined. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, based on this segment alone, rumor has it that mixed tag that they're building to will probably happen in Dallas at WrestleMania 32. I don't, I don't even know if it will be that late. Why not? Why don't you just build it till Mania and make it mean something? SummerSlam's the only other option. Well, that's the thing. She's fighting in UFC at UFC 190 on August the 1st. Okay. SummerSlam is August the 24th. Correct. So as long as she came out of it in relatively good shape and health, mm -hmm. she might be able to do it. Yeah, but do you really want to rush that? I mean, that's five months away. Yeah. Yeah, but that would, easily, that would be a good way of plugging onto Raj. That's true. Because I think that's around July, August time, isn't it? Yeah. I know because I'm going to start marathoning it on Netflix because I, I really dig the trailer. And, of and course, I've never seen an episode. Wayne is going to have San Andreas out around that time as well. Oh, Mother Nature, the movie? Yeah. True. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, there's opportunity there. There really is. SummerSlam is going to be in New York this year. Well, Barclays Center. Because so. I'd have thought by next year... Rock's going to be busy doing Shazam and all that. Yeah, that's true. Maybe that is setting it up for SummerSlam. That makes sense, but it seems like that they try to build it to Mania unless they want to just do the Rock and Triple H at Mania next year, and I think that's probably the right direction to go. Or Rock versus Brock. I don't think that's going to be something that's going to happen now because I think that Brock's going to end up turning if he hasn't already, technically. Who says you can't have Rock versus Brock face versus face? You can, but I mean, it'd be more impactful if one of them was a heel. No, it wouldn't. I mean, considering Brock Lesnar's style is literally impact. Yeah. Involving blood. Yes, indeed. It, it, it doesn't need to be. Clearly the thing... It, it's the reality era, if Triple H says it. That's true. They like to see people really beat the... Basically, they want to see stiff wrestling ally New Japan. They got it. They got it. Jeff Jarrett was onto something. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, they're going to be taping um, GFW tapings at the Orleans in Las Vegas. Yeah, about the ages away. Yeah. So, good luck to to Jeff Jarrett and Global Force. But I say that in the middle of this. So uh, let's talk about what happened to Stephanie when she ran her mouth. <laughs> She says it's her ring and to get out, and Rhonda basically says that, in, understand, any ring that I step into is my ring. Wow. You want me to leave, why don't you make me? So Triple H is like, you know what, I've had enough of all this, and then The Rock and Triple H get into it, and then Rondo, Rondo, the amazing Rondo. Rondo of blood. The, um, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 reference. So Rhonda basically judo tosses Triple H, and Stephanie goes for her special slap, and she gets caught with, like, basically an arm bar. And she gets tossed down, and that's the end of that segment. Very special. And obviously got a lot of uh, media attention that night, not just the day after today, but that night she actually got media attention, too. Yeah, being sports, and I loved it. 
Didn't they actually have like a crawl that night right after it happened on Sports Center? I heard something about that. Wouldn't be surprised. Neither would I. So, our next match, unfortunately, was kind of marred by a very freak injury that happened during the day. Apparently, Bray Wyatt injured his ankle, like, like sprained it bad, and there were rumors that he was not going to participate. Obviously, that was never going to happen, but I mean, he was walking around in a, um, in basically a cast throughout the day, and he couldn't put any pressure on his foot, and then when he came out for his entrance, and I'll go into that in a minute, you could definitely see he was noticeably limping when he first comes out holding the lantern. A lot of people were limping, but then that was the ring entrance. We'll get to that. <laughs> so, we get the introduction of the people that lead Bray Wyatt out. Obviously, no Harper, no Rowan. Now, no Mark Ro uh, Crozer in the Rells. No, this time, Bray Wyatt comes out with basically scarecrows from The Walking Dead. <laughs> well, no, I was going to say, wasn't the main villain of Jeepers Creepers a scarecrow? The Creeper? Kind of, yeah. That's the best way to put it. It was a mix between that and... Oh, I'm trying to think. The Scarecrows that are like that from... Some movie or TV series, I can't remember what. Mm -hmm. Oh no, the, yeah, the Scarecrows from one of the Doctor Who episodes. Well, I say Walking Dead because when this was going on, Walking Dead was just finishing up its season finale, so... True. I thought that was an appropriate thing to say. Um, a really stupid line on commentary that I picked up on. JBL, I believe, is the one that says this. How appropriate. He says, 20 of, 20, yeah, no lie. 20 of Undertaker's opponents have been Hall of Fame, future Hall of Famers, or World Champions. Um... Had people forgotten about Nathan Jones? <laughs> the answer is yes. He wasn't in that match, was he? He was a part of it. Is it well, yeah, but it's officially credited as a two-on-one handicap, isn't it? But it wasn't, though. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a two-on-one handicap match. It was a tag team match that they never give credit to. Yeah, that's supposed to it. Also, John Gonzalez isn't in the Hall of Fame. Uh, no, he's not. No, no, he's not. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, Psycho Sid isn't in the Hall of Fame. The boss man's not in the Hall of Fame. I don't think he will be. I, I don't either. Certain reasons. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to... Well, Psycho Sid would have been champion, so that actually defuncts him out of that list. Yeah. But the, the point is, basically, is that... That's a falsified statement. <laughs> yeah. So, The Undertaker comes out, and, oh my god. He looks fine. I know all the rumors think he looked like a decrepit old man. He comes out, he looks fine. But the fact that this is done in broad daylight, and they just thought that fog machines were going to create the intensity they needed for that entrance, it just seemed like a very underwhelming entrance for The Undertaker at WrestleMania. The entrance wasn't good, but no. there's one positive thing that I wanted to take out of it. Okay. So the first time in three WrestleManias, mm -hmm. Undertaker looked healthy. I agree with that completely. Undertaker looked more like how he looked at WrestleMania 20 mm -hmm. in 2004. Yeah. He looked podgy in the face. You know, he, he looked muscular in his top. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, with his chest and his arms, he looked more like his old self rather than true. the steroids have kicked in. I'm going thin and reiki. Yeah. It's just, it seemed like it wasn't a WrestleMania entrance for The Undertaker. It felt like it was just like a regular Raw or SmackDown or like a, like a B pay-per-view. Oh, I know. RBD was having a lot of fun with the marijuana. What do you have? Good lord. Maybe do the smoke machine, guys. We need that for Halloween Horror Nights, guys. Just no more dry ice, okay? No more. <laughs> <laughs>
So we pick it up midway through the match like we do here. Um, if you haven't listened to my commentary way of telling this recaps. The Undertaker goes for Hell's Gate and Bray escapes from it. Hits the Uranagi and the Leaping Back Senton gets a two off of that. He goes for Sister Abigail, gets stopped by the Goozle from the Undertaker. He hits the tombs, he hits the choke slam. He goes for the Tombstone, and Bray Wyatt kicks out at two because it's WrestleMania, and that's how things work. Finishers do not work right away at WrestleMania ever. <laughs> well, they don't anymore because, and and that's where I think the fans were really starting to like it mm -hmm. because they realized this is the point where. Undertaker, pro is this where Undertaker's losing? Yeah. It was that point when they really were getting embedded into the match, going, we don't want to see him lose again. Please, not again. And, you know, people definitely wanted to see Bray win. Yeah, totally. Also wanted he to see Taker win. I think people want to see both win, but that's impossible. <laughs> yeah, especially, they booked themselves into a corner here, basically. But... He goes for the tombstone, he gets countered, Sister Abigail connects 1-2 and a kick out. He does his exorcist crab walk, and of course the spot that everyone on Twitter was saying was going to happen does happen, because Undertaker sits right up and stares at him and basically Bray crumples into a pile. <laughs> they trade punches, he goes for Sister Abigail again, he does the kiss of death, he gets shoved off into the buckle, he gets caught off with the momentum, carried into the tombstone, 1-2-3, and the Undertaker wins again at WrestleMania. It was alright. I mean, it wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but it wasn't terrible either. I mean, it's not the worst Undertaker match we've ever seen. I'll say that right now. It was certainly entertaining, though, because yeah. the streak wasn't involved. That's what makes it more entertaining now, that Undertaker is quote-unquote human, and he can lose. He's infallible. That means that he could possibly lose again, and it's not, oh, he's just going to win. Let's go get some popcorn. Very true. Very true. Yes. So, who knows what's going to happen with The Undertaker at WrestleMania 32. My guess is going to be one last match and he'll retire in his home state, in his hometown. That makes yeah, the most sense to me. It makes sense. Alright, so let's talk about the main event, shall we? <laughs> Did you hear the message on Twitter that when Roman was coming down from... Uh, the high above and the longest uh, time he ever came down of any sort of arena he's ever been in, there was actually a guy who forcibly shoved him. Yeah, because security was shoving a lot of people. They were There were cops around him. It felt like Madison Square Garden in the 90s. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's the problem with coming in through the crowd when you're less than popular. I think after tonight, he may have to stop that. <laughs> But we'll talk, like I said, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, yeah, I wrote this. I was like, Mark, shove him. He shoves back. They're surrounded by cops. <laughs> Here comes Lesnar. Huge pop for the entire crowd. It really seems like there's nobody cheering for Roman Reigns at this point. Did you hear any reaction for Roman at all other than just sheer, like, hatred? I didn't hear there much. There some cheers, but not a lot. You're like... Yay, Roman! And that person got beaten down, and they stopped, and like, yay, Roman! They're bleeding profusely, and then it's like, oh, Roman! And punch him one last time, and there's like, you say Roman Reigns sucks right now. <laughs> Pretty much like that. Paul Heyman introduces Brock Lesnar, and right away, the beating commences. <laughs> A German suplex, an F5, 30 seconds in. Roman ends up going for multiple punches, and he busts Lesnar open. Within about a half a minute. I'll give, I'll give credit to, uh, for those of you that know anything about uh, um, gigs, I'll give credit to uh, the referee for being able to keep the, uh, the quote-unquote gig long enough so this could happen without anybody realizing what was going on, because immediately Brock is just bleeding profusely. And no one real unless you were paying attention, you didn't really realize that it wasn't done hard way. Because that's what it certainly looked like. But it wasn't. I can assure you that. And that no blood rule in the PG era, that was kind of thrown out the window on WrestleMania, apparently. Well, when it's Brock Lesnar, I think you have sway. <laughs> I think right now that we may be seeing, the not necessarily right away, 
But I think within the next five years, we're going to see the end of the PG era of WWE. They're really wanting to push the envelope a whole lot more every single time now. Well, considering we get a weekly bitch counter, so... <laughs> that was a drinking game, actually. We'll talk about the uh, Raw is Bitch in a minute. So... <laughs> Roman hits a couple clotheslines, ducks the third clothesline, German suplex, and then immediately all the people on the internet that make memes and sell wrestling t-shirts that they make themselves get the greatest catchphrase in the history of man, and Lesnar looks at the camera and says, Suplex City, bitch, and it starts immediately. <laughs> German upon German upon German. He picks up Roman. He hangs him out to dry across the top rope. Repeated knee strikes, and he's really laying it in there. This is a really snug match, actually. It really was. Yeah, it was It was just done perfect. It was a tight, violent fight between two superstars that knew exactly what they were doing. And I can say I will, all I want about Roman Reigns, and I have before, and I will continue to do so, but Roman earned his uh, check last night, without a doubt. And Ashley is going to be rejoining us in a second. Hopefully I'll be able to get him immediately. There's a problem with this call. Right when I'm trying to talk about the main event. We're about to go into Raw, folks. But, um, real quick, we're going to be uh, continuing to talk in a second about what ends up happening when Brock decides he wants to try to literally behead Roman Reigns. And uh, I will mention that in a moment once uh, Ashley gets back on the call here. Hopefully he'll be joining us sooner rather than later. Um, we got a lot to talk about with the finish of this match. And also we're going to roll right into Raw from last night. Because technically it's officially after midnight now. Ashley still with us? And we're having an issue apparently with the call here. So uh, hopefully uh, he'll be joining us soon. Um... Yeah, this edition of Raw that I'm going to talk about tonight, really interesting. We lost the call there, so hopefully Ashley will be calling back momentarily. Um, this is a very interesting match, because basically this kept the crowd completely not on their hands. They weren't sitting on their hands. They weren't doing anything to, like, forget this match. It doesn't matter or anything like that. They were actually completely into this match, regardless if you were a fan of Brock Lesnar, and most of the crowd were, obviously. Or you were one of the very small few that were cheering for Roman Reigns. Both of you were pacified in the way that this match went down. And, uh... Ashley has left us, so I will try to continue as much as I can here. So, um... Basically, what ends up happening after this... Is he goes for the repeated knee strikes. Lesnar gets caught by Roman with a knee lift... And uh, Ashley's going to join us in momentarily. All right, uh, we're talking about uh, when Roman is on the ring apron right now. Yeah. And he catches Lesnar with a knee strike, and he starts pounding away. And then the next thing you know, Lesnar just gives him the stiffest lariat I've seen in a long time and just knocks him off the ring apron like he's worthless. Which is, you know... Brock Lesnar. It's fair. It's, fair. It's, the, it's the style that this match is going. Yeah, exactly. It, it's trying to be sort of very New Japan style. And the, totally. These two are big guys. Mm -hmm. They're just going to beat the crap out of each other. Exactly right. And that's exactly what the fans wanted to see. Whether, like I said before, when you were off the call, when it comes down to it, whether you were one of the millions and millions of Brock Lesnar fans or you were one of or two of the few that were cheering for Roman Reigns, you both were pacified in the way this match was rolling. So we get back into the ring, and Suplex City continues. So release snap Suplex, overhead belly to belly, sends him back into the ring. That looked dangerous as all get out. Credit to Brock Lesnar for being able to get Roman over, and credit to Roman Reigns for not killing himself when he landed on his head. He hits the F5, gets a two count off of that because it's WrestleMania and you kick out of finishers. He takes off his gloves and apparently this becomes a medieval duel because he just slaps Roman Reigns in the face. Hard. Yeah, this is the way to go. <laughs> Roman starts smiling. His blood is dripping down his lip, obviously, because he got busted open. That's the hard way. And he's basically asking Brock to do it again. It's like, please, sir, can I have another... 
and he's just laughing at him. So Brock stops his laughter dead in its tracks with two German suplexes. Hits the F5, 1, 2, and still manages to kick out right before 3. So he tosses Roman like trash to the floor. And Brock ends up going to try to post him. And Roman posts Brock. And this is when craziness starts. This is the blade job from earlier that I was talking about. The punches at the beginning, he busted him open the hard way. Like, the eye got busted open. And obviously, it was starting to swell during the entire match. But this right here, when he hits the post... Kudos to being able to pull this off without most people knowing what was going on. When he comes back up, he is just muda, crimson mask like crazy. I love that you had to drop in the muda reference. <laughs> I, had, I had to. I know my stuff, sir. So I know, just he's, it in. <laughs> you just at what point muda was that? Is my question. <laughs> so they get back in at nine. Roman hits a Superman punch. Lesnar's pretty much rocked that the only thing keeping him standing is just like a boxer is the ropes at this point. So, he ducks the third one. German is countered with a back elbow, and he finally gets out of that. A headbutt, and finally hits a Superman punch. Lesnar finally down. He spears him. It's WrestleMania, so even Reigns knows he can't win him with one spear. The fans would have rioted if that would have happened. He hits the second one. Lesnar kicks out of three. Goes for the Superman punch. Transition into the F5. Just like I believe was going to happen anyway. And we hear some very familiar music, Ashley. Yeah. Here comes Seth Rollins running down the ramp with the Money in the Bank briefcase. Offering to cash in. Allowing the fantasy booking that I've heard a few times on the internet... Of this becoming a triple threat match. Yeah, you said this too. I've been calling this since Rollins got the briefcase back in July. So... Yeah. Okay, it wasn't exactly how I said, but hey. I pretty much said that the end of the night would be Rollins with the belt. Yeah, right. but it wasn't the way that people thought it was going to go. A lot of people knew that this was going to happen. They just picked a different finish for it. And I think... I, the, didn't, I didn't think they'd write something new. Too obvious. The, the Roman winning and then Rollins cashing in on him was way too obvious. Way too obvious. Yeah, but I, as I say, I didn't think the writers, knowing how they work, mm -hmm. I didn't think they were going to write something new. Yeah. Like, have somebody come in, join the match, and cash it in, just to really confuse things. Which would have been funny, because, obviously, when a cash-in happens, the person has to be vertical before you can do anything. But un unless that is something from a previous match, because obviously we've seen cash-ins that happen when people were already down. So it could go either way, depending on how the storyline is flowing at the time. Well, technically one of them was up, weren't they? Yeah, he yeah, he did get up. So One of them was up when the bell rang. So The bell rings again, <laughs> which technically signifies the end of the singles match and the beginning of the triple threat match. So Roman gets booted out of the ring, Lesnar eats the curb stomp, and I really like the way they did this here. He goes for the F5 on Rollins, Reigns spears him, and then Rollins ends up curb stomping Roman, and one, two, three, the entire place erupts. Seth Rollins is the new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Proving that the NXT Championship is a stepping stone to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Unless you're bigger, you'll buy Dallas. Yeah, unfortunately. Kevin Owens, I could see being a world champion. And that's sooner rather than later. Yeah, no lie. Especially with Finn Balor coming in sometime sooner rather than later. He's going to be touring with the company soon, actually. So, Rollins wins. Roman doesn't, which makes everyone happy. Brock Lesnar is angry, but he doesn't go all Bret Hart and destroy the set, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, so WrestleMania, it was a great way for me to come back into WWE. There was a lot of things I liked. There were a lot of things I didn't like. We just talked about those. Um, by and large, Ashley, I'm sure you probably agree this WrestleMania was pretty good. Yeah, it was a strong one. Yeah, very much. Uh, compared to what we've had the last several years, yeah, this was a very strong WrestleMania. We 
Which it sort of needed to be with the yeah. bad builder. Totally. That's the I think that's why a lot of people are giving it possibly more praise than it deserves. I agree with that. Yeah, I, I'd say it's up there with 17 mm -hmm. as my favourite to watch as an experience. But in terms of matches, yeah. 17 is by far top. Mm -hmm. But it, the, the thing that made this WrestleMania was the surprises. Oh, totally. The yep. Ronda Rousey stuff, yep. the click, yep. the cash-in, uh, the ridiculous RKO. Yes. Ridiculous RKO from Cena. Yeah. So Rusev. Um, the ladder match. The really horrible uh, Triple H entrance. Big Show thinking that he's Andre's son again. Yeah. Triple H Love is Love Yeah. It was a good show, and when I decided to bring WWE back to pop, I decided, obviously, to do it this way, the way I'm doing it with you, and we talked about starting to do pay-per-views and then Raw. Well, obviously, this rolls us right into Raw, and the Raw after WrestleMania is always a very, very entertaining crowd. Arguably an entertaining show as well. Yeah, completely. Um, well, well, partially. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> well, no. If you if we're going on last year mm -hmm. and the year, the international audience, yeah, obviously tries to make it their own, yes. which is understandable because mm -hmm. First Amendment and all that. Gotcha. Um, as long as it isn't the Second Amendment, <laughs> otherwise Roman Reigns would not be going for the ground. Nope. <laughs> Roman Reigns would have been probably left at the uh, top of the steps, actually. Well, it was... It, you were always expecting dodgy stuff, because yeah. you're back to normal television writing, so yeah. there was a bit of it there, but... Not much. It was better than most of the roars in the build-up to Mania. Once again, the crowd was really really into what WWE wanted to give them as long as it was something they wanted. If it was something they didn't want, they're going to let you hear about it, just like they have the previous couple years. Uh, let's talk about the opening segment of Raw, shall we? Oh, uh, Brock Lesnar. Comes out to a huge babyface reaction from the crowd. As Paul Heyman uh, basically appoints himself the advocate to the non-PG ass-kicker of the PG era. Yeah. And the fans again, start... Fair. Go ahead. Which again is fair. <laughs> yes. And the fans immediately start chanting Suplex City. Bitch. <laughs> I, I wrote the... No, Heyman actually covers that up. I thought that was really funny because the line I wrote in my notes says, Suplex City chant make Brock smile. <laughs> And Paul Heyman, of course, had to say that it was Suplex City, bitch. <laughs> so apparently everyone's Jesse Pinkman now. Yeah. Makes sense. So, basically, Heyman says that Brock bitch-slapped Roman Reigns. But for some reason, no one wants to call him out by his name. They're like, the challenger, or the number one contender. Seth Rollins is the only person that mentions him by name at the beginning promo. Well, it's because Heyman likes Roman Reigns. Oh, uh, yeah, you can tell. <laughs> and eventually, we'll probably get that double turn that people have been talking about, especially because Roman needs a mouthpiece, like, now. But I think we're going to we're gonna build a little bit longer before Roman gets turned heel. I think it'll probably happen before SummerSlam, though, if I had to guess. And then The Rock tries to straighten him out, and then we get Rock and Roman Reigns, and then Roman gets put over by The Rock, which is what he wanted to do anyway. No. That's what The Rock said he wanted to do. He wanted to put his boy over. Yeah, but then the crowd would just boo both of them. Well, it's it's funny because when The Rock came out at Mania, he wasn't getting the the absolute nuclear heat that he got at Royal Rumble for helping him. So he's like, ah, I'm here to shut up Triple H. I'm not here to talk about Roman Reigns. Forget him. Let's talk about me. Let's talk about Fast Seven. Yeah, no lie. 
I will be watching that Friday night, actually. Cheap plug. That video is coming up here on Pop on Friday. <laughs> late. Super late. But I'm sorry about that. He says, Furthermore, I will tell you that Roman Reigns can either sink or swim from here. Brock almost has earned his respect, but, kid, you still got a ways to go. So Brock hits the F5, and here comes the slimy, disgusting Seth Rollins for the cash-in to make it a three-way. He curb stomps both of them, and he pins the challenger and not the champion, and then just scurries away. Paul Heyman talks about lawyers and court. But like, Brock doesn't believe in any of this. He doesn't really like lawyers at all. He thinks they're all scumbags. He says he wants his rematch clause invoked. And he doesn't want it to happen at Extreme Rules. He doesn't want it to happen at SummerSlam. He wants it to happen tonight on Raw. Crowd's going nuts for this, actually. Yeah. As they should do. Yeah, no lie. It's this it's this crowd especially. <laughs> this crowd especially is going to be somebody really quick to react to something like this. Be interesting to see whether they're also the same crowd tomorrow. Yeah, I don't think they should be. I'm but curious. People might have stayed over for the week. I don't know. I thought SmackDown is now live on Thursdays. Oh no 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 no! Not yet. They're recording it tomorrow. Uh, okay. Somewhere in Cal- I think it's Cali or okay Vegas. I'm not sure. And okay. then they're having the week off before. Next Monday's Raw in Austin next Tuesday, which I guess will also be probably Texas area before okay. they head over to the K of U and ah. Euro do you, do you ever go to any of these shows, Ashley? No, because they cost too much. <laughs> I tried to get. Why t- do you think I'm going to watch six hours of wrestling for twenty two pound fifty? Where is Chikara going to be at that you're going to? It's going to be in Wolverhampton. Oh, okay. I thought you were coming over here. I was like... You're going to be no. watching... Well, Batman's not... Well, uh, probably closer to like four four hours with like intervals of about an hour and a half or whatever. Yeah. I... And for that same money, for, for that same time, mm-hmm. I might have to pay like 40 or 50 pounds for a WWE show. Yeah, it's... Which I understand the step up in price, mm-hmm. but I think I might... Well, ho- I'm hoping... To get better quality wrestling. Yeah, I know why. Than in the E. Well, I didn't pay anything for my NXT ticket. I got it because they full sale gave it to me. But when it comes down to it, it's like supply and demand. If you look at WWE Shop right now, the NXT shirts were 20 bucks straight up. And now they're to the normal WWE price of 25 bucks. So, yeah. That sucks. <laughs> I'll have to spend a lot more money next time I get an NXT, apparently. <laughs> All right. Shame. Shame on that. Yeah, I know. I understand. So, here comes Stephanie, and of course she's favoring her arm, but she's not mentioning anything, because, obviously, why would a heel she mention that? Triple H's jacket, circa yeah. 2000. That's true. She's favoring her arm, and the fans are chanting Ronda, Ra- Ronda Rousey. Seth Rollins appears on the Today Show on Monday, apparently, and he's kind of not there at the moment. So, you want your rematch? Fine. I'm sure Seth Rollins is the defending champion, and he will gladly give you a rematch later tonight. So, Stephanie bombs out. Heyman says, I got a spoiler for you tonight. For the first time in a decade, Brock Lesnar will be wrestling on Raw. Do you remember who the last person that Brock faced on Raw? Ooh. Something to do with the build up to Goldberg, obviously. Probably Guerrero. Last person he faced on Raw was Tommy Dreamer. Okay. Because Dreamer was talking about it on Twitter tonight, actually. It was funny. <laughs> He's like, I'm still standing. I'm still hurting, but I'm still standing. So he says tonight he's going to beat Seth Rollins and not Lillian Garcia, who Heyman seems to legitimately not like. (laughs) But Paul Heyman himself is going to announce Brock Lesnar, once again the brand new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. So we get our announcement of our card for the night. Obviously we have that match that may or may not happen. John Cena has an open challenge for the United States title, which could be anybody. 
probably some sort of a debut if you had to guess on that, but at least at that point, right? And then I would say the matchup that everybody wants to see Daniel Bryan and Dolph Ziggler for the Intercontinental title. And that's, we and that's what we're opening with, exactly. That was crazy. I really, really like this match a lot. <laughs> Especially with Wade Barrett and commentary. No Not lie. just berating them, actually saying these two know how to work. Totally. So you know, you... Showing respect, but also trying to say, should be my go. Oh, yeah, totally. And I have a no problem disagreeing with that. That he should definitely still be champion, but then again, I'm not the person that is giving Wade Barrett wins. If I were he would probably do a lot better than he does on television. I've said mm -hmm. numerous times I really would like to see Wade Barrett as a world champion, but I don't think WWE will ever do it at this point. What do you think? Later rather than sooner. <laughs> I hope he does, because I really, with, with what he did with the Nexus, I mean, Barrett was, was white hot. They did the program with Cena, and then Cena pretty much obliterated him in Extreme Rules. And then it was kind of like he had to regroup and they had to run with the Intercontinental Championship the first couple times. And then the Bad News Barrett gimmick almost made him a baby face, but they decided they wanted to cool on that. Just like they did with Cesaro, which instead of turning him, they put him with Heyman. So, I don't. I think Barrett will end up being a face somewhere down the line. But, I mean, I'm sure he'll get face reactions in the UK like he did last time. Yeah. I always enjoy those crowds, too. You guys have great crowds. I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> we ruin everything. Yes. Wink face. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the match, shall we? Uh, Asher, this match is a really good back-and-forth match. I went on record a long time ago to say that Dolph Ziggler and Daniel Bryan could possibly be, if booked to be such, the Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko of this era. And they sort of proved it last night. Yep. To some extent... And, you know, matched it here as well. Mm. Uh, the headbutt's bit, I don't entirely get. It's weird. I don't understand. It what? just looks like, a, it's just like, some, it, all, all they need to do is like be like El Torito and like put the fingers on their heads to go like horns. Don't talk about it. It just looks like some sort of matador thing with the way that they would charge again. It was just like. I'm just going to butt my head in. I'm just going to move my head close towards you and then move it in a headbutt direction. Well, it's probably just so JBL could make goat references because that's pretty much all it was done for. <laughs> yeah. All right, let, let, let's talk about this match, shall we? Um, I really enjoyed what it was. A really great back and forth match. So, Brian hits the charging drop kick in the corner twice, puts him on the buckle, climbs up, and in a way, I've never seen someone get out of this predicament before. Dolph ducks out and Brian gets crotched up top. I thought that was really unique. Especially when Dolph got crotched later on. Yeah, that's exactly what happens right after that. So, Dolph gets caught with a backdrop superplex and still, Dolph still has to kick out. So, the roundhouse kicks, connects, he goes for the buzzsaw kick, gets ducked, roll up, one, two, and a kick out, which rolls right into the yes lock, which is countered into a jackknife cover, and Brian's up, backslide, which is countered, 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 and Brian gets tossed shoulder first in the ring post, Ziggler goes for the zigzag, gets swatted off, charges in, super kick, connects, one, two, and Brian kicks out. So then they go to the trade headbutt spot after their punches to their knees. Well, they're trading headbutts, and then out of nowhere, Brian hits the fire-breathing knee and gets the win. Still a really good match. Yeah, and, it was. Uh, and then, especially the attack that came afterwards. Then fun starts, because Wade Barrett attacks Brian, and here comes... Here comes a soccer hooligan. <laughs> here comes Travis Bickle. Tra yeah, pretty much. Travis Bickle as a, like, a football hooligan. Because he's got, like, his his goatee is kind of, like, dreaded up, kind of like Captain Lou used to do with the uh, the rubber bands. I mean, you could pay really top dollar to get your hair done like that, but I don't know about the goatee and, like, the sideburns. That just looked really weird. Well, no, the, the, the mohawk was just as it was. Yeah. With uh, a lot of gel. 
That was awkward. Yeah, the beard, the beard was all sort of done into sort of bows and everything, like you get on, I believe, Britney Spears' uh, Baby One More Time video. Uh, when you When you are on a cruise ship and you get off the deck and you walk on to the port that you're on, within five minutes someone's going to ask if you want a buggy ride or if you want your hair braided. Seamus apparently wanted his hair braided. Yeah. So, immediately the first thing I think of is we're going to get this super team of Wade Barrett and Seamus as heels. And I think that's going to be awesome. So, that ends up happening pretty much right away because the bro kick gets hit on Brian. And all of a sudden, he starts slapping Dolph around. He says, come on, show stealer, come on. Dolph starts fighting back, but gets duck, decked, and then white noise connects. And the fans are chanting, you look stupid. <laughs> Which is, again, it's fair. It's fair. <laughs> Dolph eats the brogue kick. Seamus gets on the mic. And he's not being, like, crazy ha-ha funny. He's being super serious. And he just says, I'm back, and he leaves. I like this a lot, actually. This sets up a lot of new stories for uh, the next season of WWE after WrestleMania. Question is, if he's back, is he better than ever? It's not his hair, for sure. My God. <laughs> sure. My God, I could create this. Okay, for all of those that have issues with trying to create WWE superstars in, like, 2K15, good luck. Just good luck. I don't think there'll be less of an issue because there probably is a mohawk that's pretty similar to that just in basic Maybe. haircut set. Maybe. I don't know. I don't have 15 because I still have a two. I still have a three. I don't It'd be have more a three complicated either. if it had uh, the Irish shamrock shaved into it. Oh, God. Give it time. Give it time, sir. <laughs> so our next match is also rather interesting because, like we were talking about before we cut off the video, there was going to be debuts tonight. And there were a couple of them, actually, and they were from NXT. Yeah. So this next match ends up being a basically a traditional Survivor Series match. So it's a four... Oh, eight-man tag. Four-on-four, four, yeah. Four-on-four, four, eight-man tag between the current WWE Tag Team Champions Cesaro and Tyson Kidd teaming with Connor and Victor of the Ascension, taking on the New Day, which are represented by Big E and Kofi Kingston, which they really missed the ball here because I know Xavier Woods' job is basically to pound the mat and says New Day so the fans can chant New Day sucks in in rhythm, obviously, but they really missed the ball here because he should have been the person teaming with Big E, not Kofi, because I can honestly have said after that that... Kofi sticks out like a sore thumb because all of these superstars are former NXT stars in one way or another. Yeah. And they team up with the Lucha Dragons. So yeah, uh, Kalisto and Sin Cara, who already have made their debut in WWE on, I believe it was like a Superstars taping, something like that. Yeah, they've been doing dark matches and superstar stuff, yeah. So technically this is just their Raw debut, but of course it's brought up as their regular debut because why not? This is their proper television debut. Exactly. So, it's the WrestleMania crowd. It's the NXT crowd. Obviously, the fans are chanting NXT. And fans were chanting for NXT all night, actually. Yeah, but they were also heavily chanting for Callista. Oh, yeah, they were. I really like... they know Samurai Del Sol. Yeah, I, especially in, in California, I'm sure he'd be definitely over. He didn't have that many showings in PWG. I think he only had two. Mm-hmm. But certainly with his style, he is very El Generico-esque. I wonder what happened to that guy. I, I don't know. I mean, I think he might have went insane, so. No? <laughs> I, I just hope him and Steen at the uh, oh. orphanage are doing a good job. Yeah, exactly. Kudos. So, uh... Kalisto and Tyson Kidd in Canada, though. I want to see that match. <laughs> There's a crowd pleaser. Yeah. That's a crowd pleaser right there. Well, no, Kalisto doing anything apparently is a crowd pleaser. Yeah, no the lie. Spot, the spot with the backflip off Cesaro's shoulders. That was great. Yeah, that happened. 
Well, we pick it up off the commercial break, and Cesaro gets tagged in, and they hit the uh, the giant swing into the side drop kick. Kalisto makes the save to a good reaction from the crowd. Connor gets tagged in. Sin Cara makes him eat the Insigiri kick. Tag in Tyson Kidd. Kofi gets tagged in. He gets a springboard chop. Two double chops. Drop kicks. Cesaro off the ring apron for good measure. Leaping clothesline and the New Day boom drop to Tyson Kidd. So he charges in. Ducks the clothesline. Double jump. Flying body press. Connects one, two, and a kick out. Charges in. Eats the back elbow. Cesaro tagged in. And he gets popped up by Tyson Kidd, Swiss Death Connects, and Victor tags himself in, which I have a feeling Cesaro was having, like, uh, flashbacks to Christopher Daniels' matches because they were facing <laughs> off hardcore there. Wow, I didn't think about that, but okay. Rick Victor looks like Christopher Daniels. You can't tell me otherwise. I think Daniels is a bit older, though. He is, and he's personally my favorite wrestler, but that's another story altogether. So, Victor tags in. Of course, Kofi rolls him up in an inside cradle, gets a two count off of that. Tagging Kalisto. It's the corkscrew flying body press. The roll-up kick, of course, connects. And uh, the grounded snap Rana, which spikes him like an exclamation point. Cesaro makes the save. Big E with the belly-to-belly -belly suplex. And he belly-to-belly -belly suplexes Tyson Kidd onto Cesaro. Victor ends up hitting the STO while the backdrop to the floor, and Victor ends up eating uh, the uh, Salida del Sol for the three count, and Kalisto officially wins the match for his team. Great showing for the Lucha Dragons here. Mainly great showing for Kalisto. Com yeah. Well, here's the thing, though. If you were you you said to yourself you don't really watch as much NXT as you would like, like you just watch the main shows. You don't watch the actual weekly pro programming. Yeah. Well, I can honestly vouch for this because this is true. The Lucha Dragons were getting really stale in NXT to the crowd not necessarily turning on them, but they were a lot more of a lukewarm reaction than they were getting previously. Now they're in WWE. Oh, yeah, nobody to face. Yeah. There isn't that much of a tag division there. Yeah. It's obviously, Balor and Itami are now going off on their own separate yeah. ventures. Yeah. And they could have had that as a tag team. Uh, you've got Blake and Murphy. You've got Enzo and Cass, which I'm pretty sure are your next tag team champions, the way that program's leading. Yeah, I love to talk NXT. I, I love NXT, honestly. Um, the next promo is for the debut of Adrian Neville. No. Yeah, they just randomly put it in and was like... Okay, sure. Is this a screw-up on the technical stuff? I guess not. And then it went to commercial. Okay, let's have some fun, because you know where we're headed next. So we get, officially, Brock Lesnar against Seth Rollins for the WWE Championship. Number one, this is starting off the 9 o'clock hour. And number two, you know this is not going to end with an actual match. This is actually, They're not going to do this on Raw. There's no way. Especially at the top of the second hour. No lie. I mean, if this was WCW, possibly. But, I mean, WCW had matches like this go into the second hour, but... That's another story altogether. So Rollins exits the ring, he grabs the mic, and he basically says, you know what, I'm feeling jet-lagged, and my foot hurts from curb-stomping both you guys last night. But I'm a fighting champion, and I will give you your rematch, but it's not going to happen tonight. So Brock's like, uh-uh, that's not happening. So he clotheslines him, tosses him in, he goes for the German, and just like you don't powerbomb Billy Kidman, you don't try to German suplex Seth Rollins because he'll land on his feet. Yeah. He hits the leaping kick, his basic, basically his version of the Ghetto Blaster, and Lesnar no-sells it 100%. Rollins sees this as a sign to get the heck out of Dodge, so that's exactly what he does. So, Jay and Jay ends up pulling Seth to safety, and they eat a double clothesline, and then Brock Lesnar goes freaking crazy. <laughs> he shoves the... He, he doesn't, like, do the Johnny Tantrum and just throw off the monitors and everything. It's like, oh, your Mountain Dew hits the ground now. No. He actually picks up the announce table and just, whoop, and just throws it over on itself. Trapping JBL and Booker T behind it. How the hell it didn't trap Cole? I'm a bit confused. Well, he escaped because he's a war correspondent. And he knows how to run away from danger. So. Yeah, but he was in the middle of the two. How the how do you escape from that? He oh. saw Brock coming. He's like, I'm running away. 
He goes in. He goes over to the old Justin Roberts land and hides, and no one knows where he is. So uh, he did not come off unscathed, though not at all. <laughs> and one of the greatest things I think I've seen in a long time, he grabs Michael Cole, he tosses him into the ring, and he gives him an F five so hard that he loses his shoe. And also the way the uh, for a minute I thought Cole might have got to break his neck. Yeah, because right he didn't away, land it perfectly. No, no, he didn't. He could have broke his nose easily the way he landed. Honestly, he might have done the EMTs with that. Yeah, and they he did a stretcher job and everything, and they didn't want to move him. So I mean, yeah, it, it's possible that he's legitimately hurt, but who knows at this point? Probably not. That's what you get for stupid tattoos, man. So, the cameraman, who looks like Wes Briscoe, even though I know it wasn't him, ends up eating the F5 too. And Stephanie runs out and basically says, I'm going to find, I'm going to stop this, stop this now, stop this craziness. And, of course, I was like, you'll get your match, you'll get your match. And Brock's like, uh-uh, and he gives, her the F, gives him the F5 anyway. And Steph's like, you know what, I'm going to find you. I'm going to put it in your pocketbook. And as a matter of fact, you're suspended, which obviously is going to write Lesnar off television since he doesn't have dates on his contract. Indefinitely. Yeah, who knows what that means. Who knows what that two means. Days. Yeah, two days. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't think we're going to see Lesnar until at least Extreme Rules at this point, honestly. I think he's going to build it up to some of line. Why doesn't he put Triple H in the Kimura and try to break his arm again? <laughs> I'll break his arm right now if you don't give me my job back. He might get hired to break Ronda Rousey's arm. That's a possibility. Well, it's not. But <laughs> oh, I know. It's the fantasy booking chair it is, but yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if that's good fantasy booking. I never said it was. I'd say I've, I've heard people saying stuff like that before. So, Stephanie gets the line of the time and basically says... You know what? After I'm going to fine you, you just signed a contract, which means I own that son of a bitch. Good. Sure. So, <laughs> so when we come back, our commentary team is now Byron Saxton, who has to sell the nature of what happened. And he's not remembering that this is pretty much his audition to be, like, on the main roster of commentary and he's failing bad well, you know why he's failing it's just him for half an hour Joey Styles could do it <laughs> yeah but I've done it before actually Byron is coming in from a wrestling capacity I know that and Joey had been doing commentary for quite a while agreed before stepping in to do... With all respect, DCW is a different kettle of fish to WWE. Uh, 100%. So I think... Byron did a pretty good job, but clearly... He was out of his element. The guys in the back knew they were trying to push this way too soon to try and just make him do the rest of the show himself. They were trying... Hence why, from out of nowhere, Jerry Lawler. Lawler was brought in. Yeah. Which, as soon as that happened, Lola and Saxon really did work together pretty well. They have a really good rapport as a, working together. I thought that worked great. That is one of the reasons to, to watch SmackDown. Yeah, I agree with that. Because Cole sort of goes secondary. I, I don't like... I've never liked Michael Cole's commentary. I, I think it's abysmal. I mean, he, he does try, but I... I'm someone who likes to call moves, as I'm doing right here, and I understand that you can call moves and also get the storyline over, and I really wish more commentators would do that. So I guess that's the reason I like Matt Stryker, and I like Josh Matthews and Taz as a team. Yeah. Because they actually do call matches. I That makes me happy. There's <laughs> <It was> unfair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, we get our next match. It is Stardust still sporting his Mr. Sinister cape from last night. And he's facing off against Damian Sandow, who has gone over to Sandow on Twitter still, but he's still Damian Mizdow on Raw. 
Mm-hmm. It feels really numb. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Stardust hits the front suplex, and we get a Cody chant from the crowd. He locks in a cravat. Mizdow punches his way out, and he gets shoved off to the ropes, kicked to the chest. It goes for crossroads, gets countered to Skull Crushing Finale, one, two, three, and Mizdow wins. Match over, Miz jumps him from behind, lays him out, and pretty much reads him the riot act with a guy in the front row that was loud as day yelling, Yeah, Mike, yeah, you tell him. (laughs) Did you hear that? There was one guy that was saying, Come on, Mike, that's right, you give him the skull crushing finale, come on. (laughs) <laughs> Just hearing him say, yeah, Mike, was funny. His dad was that. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't... His dad is amazing hair, by the way. It wasn't... Uh, says Zack Ryder. It wasn't his... <laughs> dad that was saying that, because obviously his dad had zero personality, and he was just... You remember when The Miz was getting beat up, and he was just sitting there like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, The Miz basically trash-talking an unconscious man, which makes perfect sense. He says, you're nothing, and he says, the fans did this, they're the reason this happened. So we're finally going to get our Miz Dow Miz match at Extreme Rules. More than likely, yeah. That makes the most sense to me. Curtis Axel comes out, What's this Axel Mania thing? Because I obviously have no idea what's going on with this. Well, he got thrown out the Royal Rumble. Correct. Well, sorry, he didn't. He didn't. He never. Yeah, he never was eliminated technically. Yeah, never technically got eliminated. So he's still in the match. Okay. And he's you. He sort of used it saying, you know, uh, Curtis Axel's time's coming. Mm. Which then sort of randomly evolved into Axel Mania. So he's using his old Michael McGillicuddy, this moment is going to be the moment line, basically? <laughs> no, it's actually better than that this time. Oh, it's a lot better than that from what I heard, but... um, Pretty much what you heard him say with the uh, don't change the channel, Axel Mania is running wild, is what he's been doing the past few weeks. And he drops the line, the road to X stream rules begins now. Who's his opponent? Adrian Neville. I No. Oh, no, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Don't worry. <laughs> his opponent is Adrian Neville. When he comes out with his cape with an AJ Styles hood, it is revealed that, once again, just like there is no mention of an Antonio, there is no mention of an Alexander... There is another A that has went bye-bye, and that is Adrian. He is now simply Neville. I thought... Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to deal with taking name first or last names away from people. I want to know why he's dressed up like Oz. <laughs> yeah. That's a weird costume. Well, at least it's not the rumored Mighty Mouse gimmick that everybody was up in arms about. Oh, it could easily change over time. We'll grow where he is next week. <laughs> Let's hope not. He always looks so studious when you see him outside of wrestling. He's got his hair up, he's wearing his glasses and everything. <laughs> it's just very weird to see him like that and then see him uh, out in the ring like that. That's his style. I know. I've been watching him for a long time, and obviously mm-hmm. this, was a, this was definitely the crowd to debut him in front of. <laughs> Because you have the NXT fans, you have the PWG fans, and obviously there were people that were watching him. And you like, have the British wrestling fans. And you have all the British wrestling fans, exactly. He did some stuff on the US indie circuits, but most of his crazy spots did come from the European stuff and the uh, British areas itself. Yeah, I've seen some of those matches, actually. So, right away, he low bridges... Axel, he hits the uh, spring up to Moonsault off the top rope. And eventually he ends up going with the fin- the moves that I know him so well for because of NXT. Whip in, reverse, ducks the clothesline, flying forearm off the rope, spinning back kick, front kick, spinning back kick, drop kick to the side of the head, charging European uppercut in the corner, scoop slam up top, red arrow, one, two, three. I've, I've called that series of spots so many times in his matches in NXT, it's not even funny. I didn't even look at notes there, as you could see what I was reading. So, yeah, that, that's just obvious now. <laughs> Good debut for Neville, though. Um, I'm curious to see where they do with him, honestly, who his first program is going to be with. Yeah, it depends what way they want to go. 
I mean, Neville seems like he would fit in SmackDown more than fit in, in Raw, but they debuted him on Raw, so who knows what they're going to do with him. I don't think there's really a brand extension anymore. You could pretty much go wherever you want. So I'm really curious to see who he works with because there's a lot of people that I think would be really fun to see him work with. Him and Brian is going to be awesome when it finally happens again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's happened somewhere. That's why I said when it happens again. I'm pretty sure it has happened before, actually. <laughs> I've seen that result somewhere. I don't remember where. Um, so, interestingly enough, John Cena comes out for his open challenge, and Byron Saxton just says Rusev when there's dead silence. Like, Rusev has just shown up, apparently, and we are not. We just don't see him. He's invisible to everyone except for Byron Saxton. So he basically does his best Mike Adamly here. See, yeah, well, it, it sort of was a, really a case of You'd have thought Rusev would have attacked it. You, you did. It but I thought it was going to be a debut, and it wasn't. It was actually something that came out of nowhere, but we'll talk about that in a second. The John Cena sucks chant, I love it. I love the John Cena sucks to the, to the song. I think that's amazing. <laughs> he ends up facing Dean Ambrose. That's interesting. I like this a lot, actually. And uh, they're setting up a program between these two. Whether it's short term or long term, it sounds like we're going to get several matches between Cena and Ambrose. Um, possibly, but it just depends on the direction we go now. I think Rusev is going to get his rematch, probably. Extreme Rules. Yeah, that makes him makes sense. Cena and Ambrose could be a match for SummerSlam. If they want to do it, yeah. You have to have Ambrose beat Rusev to get the number one contendership spot. Unless Rusev loses. Yeah, that's true. Rusev yeah, can't lose. So then he's back down to the... I don't want that to happen. I don't want Rusev to get killed just with one loss to Cena. I don't want the internet to be correct. <laughs> so, this match is really good, by the way. Cena locks in a chin lock, which is really interesting because he's using a rest hold, and he also uses a hair pull takedown to take Ambrose down to the mat. That's interesting. Very interesting. Lawler has joined Saxton on commentary by now, by the way. Yeah, during the break. Yeah. So he hits four right hands, comes off the ropes, charges him with the clothesline into the bulldog that he does all the time. Ambrose heads up top. He lands on his feet, and Cena connects with the protobomb. Five knuckle, of course, is stopped with a straight back kick. And the chop jabs. I feel like I'm watching a good old-fashioned Super Dragon match right here, so... Not necessarily the violence party, because that was chop forearm, chop forearm, but I believe Joe has done this combination before. Yeah. And I'm sure that he used that this same combination when he was also uh, working for CZW. Probably. Makes sense to me. Comes off the ropes, Cena makes him eat the big boot, and that, of course, goes for the jawbreaker lariat. He ducks out of that, and Protobomb connects five-knuckle shuffle after smirking to the crowd. Goes for the AA, gets countered, sunset flip, one-two, and a kick out. Goes for the STF, it gets kicked off, an elbow into the jawbreaker lariat does connect this time. Only got the two-and-a-half off that. The double underhook DDT is countered AA, and Ambrose elbows out of it. They trade punches. He whips him in, charges, and eats the back elbow. Ambrose with the Tornado DDT, 1-2, and a kick out. So Cena goes to the floor to break up momentum. Ambrose heads up top for the standing elbow drop, which I think is a very unorthodox move, but I guess it works. He tosses Cena... As long as Dean Ambrose hits the Nigel, it's an important match. Exactly, and I say that every single time. So he tosses Cena in at 6. Cena pops up like nothing is affecting him. AA, 1-2, and Ambrose kicks out before 3. Puts him on the buckle, puts him on the shoulders, going for the AA off the top. Of course, that does not work. And Matthew from Botchamania probably uh, is very happy right now. He's probably happy about quite a few bits, but there was an easy spot there for him to find. This is bad. So he knocks him off, he climbs up, headbutt, and he goes for a sunset bomb, but Cena holds on, quote-unquote, 
And Ambrose hits a vicious sit-out powerbomb, and Cena, of course, no-sells that, rolls right into the STF. Ambrose gets to the ropes, and the AA is countered, picks the ankle, and Ambrose locks on the STF of his own. And the internet explodes, <laughs> because that's how you lock in an STF. It would have made more sense for me, personally, as a longtime fan, that he used the Regal Stretch instead. Well, still. I understand okay. why he did what he did, though. Then what? <laughs> yeah, he drags him to the middle, and he kicks off the attempt again. AA is countered into the double arm DDT, which I don't call dirty deeds because that's the bulldog driver. He gets a two and a half off of that. Ambrose with a right hand. Cena fights back. They trade punches. He slaps Cena in the face to disorient him momentarily. And dirty deeds is countered once more. AA is countered once more. Ducks the clothesline. Cross body caught. Picks him up on the shoulders. AA one two three match over. Ambrose says he'll be back for the championship, and we have mutual respect from the two. This was a really awesome match, actually. Yeah, it was... You can tell that even the Cena haters seem to like it. Oh, totally. The John Cena sucks chance quieting down afterwards. Completely agreed there. Rollins is in the back talking to Renee. Brock is an animal who's completely out of control. But enough about him... Let's talk about me, the fact that I walked out as your new WWE World Heavyweight Champion, and who interrupts him but Randy Orton, who obviously has a little beef with the fact that he's the one who beat Seth Rollins before he won the championship. He basically says, like I said, remember I beat you before you cashed in, and one of your problems is no longer your problem, but I'm your problem now. I want that championship. And then the train falls off the tracks, because here comes Kane in the big show. And because this is the only thing I really did not miss at all about watching WWE programming and not watching it for almost three months, I hate six-man tags right now. And that's all I got for main events for Raw while I was now watching. Now listen, player. Huh? Now listen, player. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I'll slow your role play. Let's go do a tag match of some sort. Six man, eight man, 47 man. I mean, seriously, it got really old really fast because the same superstars were in the same six man, eight man tag match every single week. And it was starting to get really old really fast. And I really hope they don't do that this time. So. Oh, no, no, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that. So, of course, we set up a six man, uh, find two partners to face off. And, of course, you know right away Roman Reigns is going to be one of them. Yay. Which is a great <laughs> idea to bring him out with this crowd. And who knows who the next person is going to be? We'll find out for the next segment. Uh, we get a, a women's uh, six, uh, six way uh, tag match. Six person. Ah, wow. Six, I hate the word diva. I'm trying to figure out another way to say it. I guess you have to. Six Diva Tag Team Match. It is AJ Lee sporting a really awesome Bailey shirt, which got a great reaction from the crowd. I'm sure Bailey was smiling from ear to ear in the back. Paige and Naomi against the Bella Twins and Natalia, who is apparently a heel now because she's with uh, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. So, oh, trust me, that relationship is more on and off than a force. <laughs> pretty much. We got a nice "We Want Bailey" chant. Um, I thought that was really cool. This match actually was pretty disjointed, but it was long. It actually worked s somewhat okay. What did you think of it, Ashley? It was better than last night. Mm -hmm. I agree. Although, having the fact that Paige did nothing... Yeah. ...was a bit... Str they kept taking Paige out on purpose, so... Mm. Whether she possibly got injured last night... Or they're angling towards something with her over the upcoming weeks. Yeah. I have to say. I'm pretty sure I did see her mum, though. In which case, that might be why they beat the crap out of her. Possible. Because they didn't want Sarai to beat the crap out of them. Yeah. Well, of course, the finish leads to Nikki accidentally throwing her Lex Luger forearm into her sister instead. And she eats the rear view, and Naomi wins. So uh, we're setting up Naomi as a challenger for the Divas Championship, is what we're looking at right now. Fatal for women thinks so extreme rules. That makes the most sense to me. So uh, Randy Orton is getting ready in the back. Uh, Ryback shows up. He says basically that he wants to feed on the authority. 
You get an interesting look from Orton, and of course he says, feed me more. Orton accepts, and yeah. Tag match announced for SmackDown. Uh, it's going to be the team of Bad News Barrett and Sheamus against Daniel Bryan and Dolph Ziggler. That's going to be fun. The British Invasion versus the Indie Sweethearts. That's going to be amazing. Oh no! Team IWC. It's DX's security from 2006 versus <laughs> the Indie Sweethearts. Team IWC. <laughs> So, uh, then we get a really short match with Rusev and Goldust, basically just to cool everyone down. Um, nothing really to say about it. Muay Thai kick, stomp, accolade, done the party. So, yeah, that was pretty much the end of that. Rusev comes out by himself. No Lana, still sporting the flags, still doing exactly everything the same. He just crushed Goldust. That was the end of that. Let's talk about the main, shall we? Oh, boy. Seth Rollins came to the big show against Randy Orton, Ryback, and Mr. Personality, Roman Reigns. <laughs> so, this match went way... The crowd just didn't care. They just lost interest midway through, and they just did not care anymore. Well, three hours. Yeah, three-hour wrestling is starting to get really tedious. I'm not going to lie. Plus, was... they have to deal with R-Truth versus Luke Harper from Superstars. I like Luke Harper, though. <laughs> And it's I, on Superstars, so any way you can watch it is on the network. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't believe we have Superstars anymore. I think, is it not on the network anymore because they had the contract issue with the UK, something like that? It's on the network where you are. Okay, it's not on the network where I think I'm... it gets deleted out on the, on the UK feeds for something else because they can't play okay. it, obviously due to the fact that Sky have the rights to it outright. So, I like this because when Rollins tags in midway through the match, the fans start doing the wave. And the camera is actually following this because you can't shut it down, apparently. The guy that in the truck turned up the house lights. I noticed that. That's how crazy that was. So, at one po so Rollins basically just stops momentarily and watches everything. He's, you know what, I'm going to slow this pace down because you guys are not going to dictate my match for me. And he basically told the fans to suck it. His, his, his prerogative. Yeah. So, Orton hits the uh, Orton Crest Superplex, and Kane gets end up tagged in. Roman Reigns tagged in. Simone dropped to Kane, and... Mounted punches to Kane, punches the Big Show off the apron. The crowd is, like, not having Roman Reigns at all right now. Anything Roman does is turning to dust. Really, it is. Like, it's not, it's not gold, it's turning to dust. Yeah. <laughs> Repeated clotheslines in the corner on Kane. It's a reverse neckbreaker to a rabbit punch, basically. That would get over if this was a crowd that liked Roman Reigns. Superman punches in. Big Show catches him with the goozle, going for the choke slam, tosses him off to Kane. Big Show with the Harpoon, and Ryback connects with Shell Shock. Curb finishers galore time. Curb stop, leap frogs over, and Goozle into the RKO from Orton. Rollins runs into this, and uh, runs away. Kane gets speared, and that's the end of that. So That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after the show's over, uh, Sting has his long-awaited announcement, basically saying that pretty much back in the day, nothing's for sure. Bo Dallas interrupts him, of all people, says Sting just needs to Bo leave, and he eats the scorpion death drop to send the fans home happy. <laughs> Trademark Scott Keith. So, <laughs> what do you think of uh, Raw right now, honestly, after last night? Do you think it was a step in the right direction after WrestleMania? It had the shock value, and mm -hmm. I think the debuts of the NXT talents... Yep were treated a lot better than Paige. You know, I did mark out for Paige mm -hmm. last year, but in hindsight, her getting the title when she did yeah. was way too early. They've done it right with these guys. They've introduced them to, to the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah. So they can battle up to get those titles when the time is right. And That's I the most important bit. I know Charlotte is going to be another uh, call-up really soon, and it sounds like that Finn Balor is going to be up there sooner rather than later, which is a shame if that happens, because eventually it's going to get to the point that everybody wants the NXT talent on the main roster, 
It's going to be just like ECW. What's going to happen to the show when all the talent's on the main roster? Considering all the names that I'm hearing that are getting picked up for NXT? Yeah, good point. Nope. <laughs> yeah, there's NXT's going to be just fine. Uh, I would say Samoa Joe will probably be debuting within the next couple months, if I had to guess. Well, he's finishing up his Ring of Honor contributions. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's got a couple more indie dates to work, I know this that. This week. Yeah. As is Tommaso Ciampa. Yeah, I saw he's done now, too. What happened there? Good question. It sounds like there's more than meets the eye. They should have pushed him about nine months ago, and they never bothered, so I don't know whether it's partly that. Or just because he's got an offer he couldn't refuse from somewhere else. Uh, I think he fits TNA, honestly. I really do. Could be there, could be DA, could be Lucha Underground. Yeah, I you keep something where he's going to be bound into a contract where he can't really. Well, of course, Ring of Honor had contracts as well. Yeah, with certain talents. True. So. Speak, speaking of uh, Ring of Honor, uh, Supercard of Honor was at nine this weekend. Yeah. One of the moments, obviously, I'm a big fan of this guy, and I'm really happy to see that his storyline ended the way it did after the matchup between Jimmy Jacobs and BJ Whitmer. I really love the fact that they finally culminated the Jimmy Loves Lacey angle with them being the last people that they saw, the Randy Savage Elizabeth style. I thought that was incredible booking. And also, as Jacobs made a fair point of last night, Mm. how about a weekend for the Age of the Fall? Oh, a great weekend for the Age of the Fall. Very great weekend for the Age of the Fall. Uh, Luke Harper got to almost kill Dean Ambrose with a power bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Seth Rollins world champion. Jimmy Jacobs is now on his way to WWE to live in Connecticut and be a corporate guy. That's going to be great. Kudos to Jimmy Jacobs for getting signed by WWE. He's going to Connecticut. Uh, that's what I heard. I believe he's going to be a writer. I heard that he was, a lot of the rumors were he was going to get an NXT, but it sounds like he's moving in Connecticut, so I guess he's going to be on the WWE creative team. Well, yeah, I think he's on creative, but yeah. the thing is, creative has to write scripts sometimes last minute. Correct. So it's easier for them to be on the road with them, so. A, f- a friend of mine is he actually. Might basing know, himself out of Stanford, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was part of the. The trucks. Or that, the buses that makes sense. And yeah. Be able, I mean, probably not. Probably not Triple H's play. Mm-hmm. Although that would be awesome if he did, because then he might get it, Triple H might be given some interesting ideas that could get used, and he become a senior writer of Raw. I think, and I th- we get good angles. You, you know, WWE is uh, with the last two nights. I'm back to caring again. Honestly, I don't know how long it's going to keep my attention, but I'm back to caring again. Um, I think everything went over the way it was supposed to tonight. I think that the main event was... I really don't think they should have done a six-man, honestly. I really don't. I am tempted by SmackDown this week. That tag match tempts me completely. Well, plus the fact that Cena, Orton, and Reigns are going to be on it. Yeah. They're obviously taking advantage of there being no live events, how shows mm-hmm. happening this week. It's true. And jumping straight into it, because of course, a week, well, in fortnight, yeah. is the UK tour, so that's when they're going to be doing matches every day, so this is how they're resting up before... Smart move. The madness. I uh, There was a lot of really great wrestling on the show tonight. Uh, most of the segments actually got a considerable amount of time. I think pretty much the only thing that really didn't get anything was Goldust and Rusev and Stardust and uh, Mizdow. I think everything else got enough time. Neville and Curtis Axel was short, but it doesn't need to be long because it was basically just a highlight reel for Neville just to get the crowd to know who he is. I I just thought it was a really good show, honestly, and I haven't been able to say that about WWE in a while. These were two good shows back-to-back, by and large. Question is, what will it be like next week? <laughs> next week, when we're sort of back to the normal television crowd. Oh, I hate the crowd most of the time. Because, of course, Ugh. I need to. Hang on. Um, Ugh, oh, wow. So, apparently, just looking at this, there's NXT house shows happening in Florida this weekend. Yeah, there is. 
So yes, Raw in Austin, SmackDown in Dallas. Pretty much a year to the day or the week. Hmm. People will take Fresno, California doing for SmackDown actually. Okay. Uh, so then uh, it actually starts Wednesday. Where uh, WWE are going to be in Glasgow. There's going to be some NXT stuff as well. Okay. Uh, Newcastle on Thursday as well as Dublin Island because that's when they split the roster. Okay. Uh, Belfast and Sheffield on the Friday the tenth, along with NXT. Uh, Nottingham and Birmingham on the Saturday. Sunday Leeds and Cardiff, and then uh, what? Sun? Wow! What's that? They're doing an afternoon show in Leeds. Okay. A mid to late afternoon show in Cardiff, and then an evening show in Manchester. So I'm guessing the crew. How the hell? <laughs> They're doing a. That's the that's a first. They're actually doing an afternoon and an evening show. That's going to be. So I guess they're going to have more trucks out of there and the talent are just going to go over because it isn't too far away. Okay. Unless, of course, the soccer match is happening at that time, in which case traffic will get awkward. But the Raw and SmackDown tapings are going to be in London. That's good. The O2 Arena. So Those are great crowds, too. I love the London crowds. And then they head over to Poland and Germany mm. and Hungary and France and Germany and Belgium. In Switzerland. Oh, Switzerland's the last stop before Cesaro gets homesick. Oh, no. Nuremberg, Germany. And yeah. then they come back to uh, New York and... Oh, Providence, Rhode Island. Wow. I've got a feeling that week more people are going to care about something involving Kimberly and Chris Dickinson that week in Providence, Rhode Island instead. <laughs> Yes, I definitely would be more interested in that at this point. Um, I will say right now that obviously auspicious by their absence were uh, The Undertaker, which was rumored to be on Raw tonight, one way or another, and that didn't happen. Well, but also makes sense. Cause yeah, totally. That's what he did. And uh, Bray Wyatt, who was not a part of Raw at all tonight. Because he's injured. Yeah, but he's, you can cut a promo when you're injured. Does he need to cut a promo, though? You got to do something with him. You got to figure out what what the next direction for Bray Wyatt is going to be right now because he's kind of directionless. Clearly, Sting. That's the right answer, but he I don't. Attacked his brother, damn it! I don't know if it's going to go that way or not. What? Seriously? But like, mention that when it comes down to Sting. Like, what is the deal with the Blade Runners having a problem with Triple H? Seriously. I don't know. I mean, obviously, the Ultimate Warrior beat Triple H, and now Sting faced Triple H, so, yeah. Rick Bassman, coming to WrestleMania 33. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to be a part of it somehow. Um, so, yeah, that's what we have for uh, Raw and WrestleMania. Uh, this will be a regular thing. This is not just a one-time-only thing. Ashley will be joining myself every Monday night for Monday Night Raw, and I will be bringing your NXT and Impact recaps on the regular on the Tuesdays. And if there's a pay-per-view, Ashley, do you want to do the pay-per-view recap after the fact? Or do you want to do it like this and do it with Raw the next day? It might be it might be easier to do it after, not directly after, but probably in the gap before Raw, but giving us enough time to cover it so, and everything. Because okay. quite often after the pay-per-views, there's shows that I catch which alive getting mm. the response from people gotcha which is always nice to hear especially if uh, they like it or don't like it completely agreed so that means we will be i can't say live but right after the pay-per-view is over we will in some a time frame we'll get that video out to you guys before raw if, as long as the converter works and then after Raw is over, we'll do a post-show talking about Raw, and I'll put that up on Tuesday. So you'll probably get, like, a double shot of wrestling every Tuesday now. Sound good? Sounds like a plan. 
awesome. And Ashley will continue to bring you his Gaming with Ash segment every Saturday here on Pop. I know we've had some issues with the uh, scheduling being kind of flip-flopped a bit, but hopefully uh, that's worked itself out and uh, 